Okay, looks like we are live. Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie, and I want to thank you all for being here for tonight's very important program. We at Standing for Truth are dedicated to defending the truth of biblical creation. We also host debates, interviews, lectures, and more. And so if you enjoy this content, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. And please share around this content as the truth is so incredibly important. One of the many ways we defend the truth of biblical creation is by inviting and hosting some really awesome guests on this program. And today we have a very special guest, as it is a privilege and an honor to have Dr. Jerry Bergman here with me today for, again, a very important show. Dr. Bergman, thank you so much for giving us your time for today's exciting program. It's great to be here. I appreciate it. And uh, to be more specific, we are dealing with uh, human evolution. And Dr. Bergman's presentation uh, tonight is titled Apes as Ancestors. And we will also be having an audience question and answer immediately following this presentation. So we do want to make this program uh, interactive. And so just please make sure you are tagging me with your questions. I know our live chats tend to get pretty wild, and I do appreciate how you guys are so engaged in these important topics. So again, just make sure you're tagging me at Standing for Truth, and that way I won't miss your questions. Now, before we get into uh, Dr. Bergman's presentation here, I do want to give our uh, guest tonight an appropriate introduction. So Dr. Jerry Bergman has taught biology, genetics, chemistry, biochemistry, anthropology, geology, and microbiology for over 40 years at several colleges and universities, including Bowling Green State University, Medical College of Ohio, where he was a research associate in experimental pathology, and the University of Toledo. He is a graduate of the Medical College of Ohio, Wayne State University in Detroit, the University of Toledo, and Bowling Green State University. He has over 1,300 publications in 12 languages and 40 books and monographs. His books and textbooks that include chapters that he authored are in over 1,500 college libraries in 27 countries. So far, over 80,000 copies of the 40 books and monographs that he has authored or co-authored are in print. Now, I do have various links in the description box of this video, uh, ladies and gentlemen, where you can find more about Dr. Bergman, including his many must-read articles that he has uh, written. Dr. Bergman, that's a very impressive resume, and I'm just glad that we're on the same uh, team and same side here, uh, brother. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. I appreciate it. Okay. So that being said, uh, Dr. Bergman, we're going to hand it over to you uh, so we can get right into the presentation. And uh, the floor is yours, Jerry. Okay. Good to be here. Get this to work. Still trying to get it to work here. Yeah, no worries. I, I could certainly guide you as well. Oh, I see it popping up right now. And there we go. We can we can see your screen uh, currently, Dr. Bergman. Now, do you want to? Do you need to see the whole thing? No, nope, we we just need to see uh, the PowerPoint slides themselves. So uh, you're not going to be able to see us. You'll just see your own PowerPoints uh, presentation. But uh, us in the audience and me as host will be able to see everything. Okay, so. This is about apes as ancestors and to oh, me, actually, Jerry, if I could stop you, I, I currently see uh, two windows. Have you, have you clicked the PowerPoint itself presentation? Okay. Let me, uh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. And then you might want to make that full screen. Okay. Well, and okay, also now. one last recommendation before you start, if you see that little box there, you might want to click hide just so. Hide. Okay. Yes. You got it. Okay. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm good now. No, well, <laughs> almost. And just make sure you click your PowerPoint because we can still see, uh, you know, the little StreamYard window here that's blocking your PowerPoint. Okay. Now we're good. Now we're good. Now we're good. Okay. This is based on Genesis 127, a real simple scripture. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created he him. Male and female, he created he them. From the King James Version. <clears throat> I'm just getting over a cold, so I've got a scratchy throat, but <clears throat> we'll get through it. And uh, this is really the heart of creation, humans. We don't really worry too much about the creation of snails or, or polywogs. We're concerned about primarily the creation of human beings. And ironically, there hasn't been that much uh, consideration of this issue among creationists. And a good example is this book, Apes, Apes Ancestors, which I recently completed with Peter Lyne and Jeff Tompkins and Daniel Biddle. And what we tried to do was evaluate the literature about human evolution. And to do that, we looked at the paleontological literature to try to find out what they had to say. There's a lot of debate about this. For example, in Christianity Today, a cover story talked about the search for historical uh, Adam. And uh, this magazine basically concluded that there is a fallen away of the belief in historical Adam. And the problem with that is, of course, from a Christian standpoint, is that the whole New Testament is based on the fact that Adam and Eve were created, Adam sinned, sin entered <laughs> into the world, and as a result, a sacrifice of Christ on the cross was necessary to negate that sin which all humans inherited. And so if there's no Adam and no Eve, it is the foundation of Christianity is decimated. The most famous example is Lucy, and there's a lot of examples in museums. The one I you see here, one is in Cleveland Museum, and the other is in the Field Museum of natural history in Chicago. And you'll notice that one looks like a male, the other looks like a female. Well, Lucy is was the most famous by far example of human evolutionary link. And the problem with that is they don't know if it was a male or female. They don't have enough body parts, skeleton parts to determine what sex it is. She was named Lucy because while they were digging up the bones, the song Lucy in the Sky was playing, and they thought, well, that sounds like a good name. So they named her Lucy. The second thing you'll notice is that these two likenesses of Lucy are really very, very different. And that's pretty obvious from these pictures here that it's a, it's a guess. And in a minute, I'll show you the bones that they actually found, which is not that many, although it's, it's recognized as the most complete fossil skeleton we have to date of historical link between man and apes. <clears throat> Let me get a drink of water here. <clears throat> that should help. At any rate, so we looked at the literature for Lucy primarily because this is the most famous example. In my book, we also looked at not just Lucy, but we looked at all the examples. And how we did the book was we had a claim by a certain person about a missing link. And that claim was typically criticized by other evolutionists who had their own claim for a missing link. And basically, each paleontologist criticized the others. And as a result, we took all of the criticism and tried to evaluate which indeed claim had the most evidence. And we found indeed all of them were severely problematic even Lucy, which is the most well-known example, and that's why I, I looked at this example. Now, when you look at religious differences in the belief between creation of Adam and Eve and uh, the example of, in this case, whether evolution is the best place for the best explanation for the origin of human life on Earth. And you'll find uh, these are of those who accept human evolution Ironically, the lowest percent was Jehovah's Witnesses. The second low was Mormons. The third low was Evangelical Protestants, which would mean, uh, be uh, many Baptist and similar denominations. Then historical Black Protestants, 38% except the uh, belief of Adam and Eve. And you can see we go all the way up to the Buddhist, Hindu, and Jews. And we can see that the vast majority, with along with the line, that means the more people accept human evolution 
as the best, best explanation for the origin of human life on earth. And so we can see even among various religious denominations, a very high percent accept evolution as the origin of man and not creation. And the next slide, it doesn't take a genius to realize that there's a huge difference. And we can see a little boy on one side and a monkey on the other side. And we can see just by the facial examples, there are enormous differences. And I selected this article because it said, this is from National Geographic, it said the DNA profiles of these two are nearly 99% the same. Well, this is simply not true. And this has been known not to be not true for years. The difference actually is about a half a billion base pair differences. In other words, there's an enormous difference between humans, human DNA, and chimp DNA, which should be obvious from looking at the facial features, the faces of these two individuals. It's not 99% similar, but it's close to a half a billion paces, bases difference, which is a huge DNA difference. You wonder why in the world do they state this something that's been wrong for decades? I don't know any reputable geneticist that would make this claim at all today. Well, it takes a while to get the information out to the public. And many people who write these articles, like for National Geographic, are not typically professional paleontologists, but they are individuals who are writers, who are authors. And they pick what they learn in somewhere and repeat information, which is not, in this case, not true. But in the, even among creationists, there is a disagreement about various uh, specimens that they claim are missing links between us and apes. So we tried to examine carefully the data and summarize what it said. And here is two books about Lucy. And uh, it's considered an amazing story. And it is the beginning of men of humankind, according to the book title here, and also is one of the most famous discoveries and the most important missing link, so to speak, between us and the chimps. Now, what did they actually find? Well, hopefully you can see the picture there. What's brown would be the bones they find and found, and the white would be what was added. So you can see the majority of the skeleton was added. In fact, you really don't even have a half of a side uh, proper. About 20% uh, of the skeleton was found. And this is one of the most complete Australopithecus skeletons ever found. And so we're talking about the most complete, that among the most complete, there's one more they claim <laughs> is more complete, but you can see that there's a lot missing. So of the 47, they found 47 bones. There's 207 in humans and 47 of 207. And of the 47, most were small fragments. And so they have a lot of fragments Therefore, there's a lot of guesswork that was required in order to determine what Lucy was like. <clears throat> there you can see another picture of her. This one, they picture her as a female. And then you see the bones they found. <laughs> and again, it's pretty pathetic. <clears throat> and tip, te technically, this is Australopith Australopithecus afarensis. And these bones were found in Ethiopia. And I'm not sure how many models there are, but I know there are at least a hundred or more in the world which display Lucy. And some background between the footprints were found. And of course, they found no hands or feet on Lucy. Therefore, they have to assume what they were like. One way of assuming is they found in 1976 some hominid footprints in Laetoli which is a province in Tanzania. And they concluded that these belong to Lucy. Well, they were wanting to find proof. And so here they've got some footprints. So let's look at these footprints. And we can see a human footprint on one side and a ape footprint on the other side. Actually, if you think about it, look carefully, humans have two feet and two hands. Apes, on the other hand, really have four hands. And this is very useful if you want to climb a tree. And to climb a tree, which most all apes are tree dwelling, and therefore, if you want to climb a tree, 
you need to have a hand, four hands to get up the tree. Humans have a hard time climbing trees because they only have two hands to pull themselves up. And you can see a huge difference between the, in this case, the feet of the apes and the feet of a human. Well, that's the footprints they found. And obviously that is the footprint of a human, not of a ape. And so they claim that Lucy and her kind had human feet and human hands. But of course, they have no direct evidence of that. And here you can see the footprints in more detail in, uh, in ash. And the footprints, the one I showed you, was the best they found. So many of the rest are not as good. And here is a picture drawn from those footprints. And you'll notice how very human the bodies are and how very ape-like the heads are. And this is common in these pictures of ape men. They show very human bodies and very ape-like heads. And that's because the evidence we have, the bone evidence primarily, is very scant. And the total of 69 prints were found. And two adults and a child, they think, were found. And these were found a 1,000 miles from the Lucy bones. So they conclude it may not have been Lucy's close type, but Lucy's basic type. And from these footprints, it's clear they were likely human. In fact, a number of people have said they look exactly like the footprints you would find today at a beach of someone not wearing shoes. And they, indeed, they look as such. My conclusion is that they are simply human footprints and have nothing to do with Lucy or any other claimed human ancestor. And 2016, they found some more. In fact, these were surrounded by modern mammals and birds, which indicates that they were modern humans because indeed we find evidence of the surrounding animals were, as far as we can tell, modern mammals and birds. Uh, some scholars conclude, and I think with good reason, that these footprints were actually the prints of footprints of the local people. Now they may be quite old, it's hard to date them because they can't date when the footprints were made they can date, though, when the ash was put down to some degree. And so there's a problem in dating the ash and assuming the footprints were put on that ash at the time the ash was laid down. So that's a problem. It's one of many problems. And then in 76, they found even more examples. And now the footprints they found are evidence of a five feet, nine inch person. And if we look at one of the pictures of Lucy in a museum compared to a modern human, we can see Lucy was a very short animal, five, around uh, 3.5 and four feet tall, less than five feet tall. And so uh, again, that's evidence that those prints were uh, from a modern human because the print impressions appear to be made by a human that was about 5'9", five, 5'10", five, inches tall, 5 feet, 9, 10 inches tall. Another aspect they're looking at, because to prove that Lucy was our human ancestor, there is a need to prove that she walked upright. And the problem is, is upright walking is very different from bipedal walking, which of course is what humans do. And we can see the pictures here show the differences in the muscle and bone structure of an ape and even an ape walking upright or attempting to and humans. So when we look at these very body, various body structures, we find something interesting. The first thing we'll look at is the skull. And then we'll look at the upright walking traits. The skull you can see in this picture here is a few small fragments of bone and you see a large amount is filled in by the investigator and these fragments here judging by the fragments that are there and if we look especially at the temple area they indicate they are from not an ape-like person but a ape period which is what i conclude lucy was simply another ape 
and this evidence supports in that direction. When you take an artist's interpretation of the face, you can see that, and there are many more examples, but I couldn't find them, but you can see three different examples of the artist's drawing from the bones that are found, and you can see how different these are, especially the uh, one in between the other two. And here again, we see the Lucy walking from what we conclude, given she was an ape. <clears throat> and uh, the other slide, you can see the green. The green are actually the body parts that we found. And so you can see we don't really have an adequate number of body parts to determine that indeed she walked regularly on two feet. And then this you can see is relatives of Lucy. And for our study, we looked at all of these different relatives and found the same problems with all of them. But for now, we're focusing on Lucy. And so con conclusion just so far, we found that we have apes and we have humans and we have zero good evidence in between apes and humans. And of course, this is a result of my study in looking at the evidence for the fossil record for evolution from apes to humans. Now, again, if you talk to individual paleontologists, they would say, well, I think I have a lot of case for my theory. <clears throat> but the critics then criticize my theory. And so we looked at the criticism and found in most cases it was valid. And then we also looked at the uh, claims by others and found the same thing is true. And a good example, if I can get some liquid here, for coffee and all night, I'm doing pretty good. I just went to Indianapolis and did uh, four presentations and ended up with a head cold on my trip to Indianapolis. But anyway, you can see now the skeletons of an ape and a human, you can see how enormously different they are. And therefore, you are looking for these differences when you find skeletons of supposed ape men. And of course, the problem is, in most cases, all we find is fragments. And therefore, there's a lot of speculation and guesswork that fills in the details. And here we can see primates on, from my left in the middle, Australopithecus, and then Homo sapiens. So you can see from the skulls, they are very different. And one reason they're different is because humans walk upright on two feet by pedal, and apes, of course, walk on all fours. And this is going to produce some differences in the place where the spinal cord goes into the brain. And we can see that area by looking at the skeletons itself and the foramen magnum, which means big hole, basically. And you can see in A, orangutan, B, a male gorilla, uh, C, a female gorilla, D, a chimp, and E, a human. Well, human, you cannot even see this because the four examples of apes that we look at all walked on all fours. Human walked bipedally. Therefore, the foramen magnum was at a different place. And when we look at the bottom of each of the skulls, we can see now the placement of the foramen magnum in all four examples compared to humans. And this dynamically shows the difference between this. So when you're looking at skulls, a key thing to look at is the location of this foramen magnum, which they did on Lucy and of course from what evidence we have, which is not much because there's not many skull pieces we use, indicates she was an ape. A major difference too between apes and humans is the brain size. The average human has 1378 gram brain, brain size. The average chimp brain size is 399 grams. And when we compare that, we can see the top line is a human, the next gorilla, which is closest to us, the next orangutan, and then chimp. And so you can see really a very dramatic difference between humans and apes. When we look at uh, Lucy's brain size, from what we can determine, it was close to a chimpanzee, considerably less than a human. And this shows you the same data, charted in a different way, 
to emphasize the difference between human brains and chimp brains. Other differences are the internal ear. Since humans walk upright, the ear has to be designed differently so that they can walk upright without getting dizzy. And apes likewise, so they can walk on all fours without getting dizzy. And when we look at the evidence we have, which is scanty, it indicates that Lucy was a chimp. Uh, a dramatic difference, which is, of course, you can't tell from looking at the skeleton, but you can certainly tell in the models that are built into various areas, in the museums especially. And one of the most dramatic differences is the whites of the eyes. The top picture, you can very clearly see the whites of the eyes. And in the picture below, you can clearly see there is no evidence of whites of the eyes. And almost all, there's one minor exception, but almost all apes, you cannot see the whites of the eyes. But yet the mannequins they show in museums of Lucy, you can see the whites of the eyes. Again, they're trying to make Lucy look more like a modern human and not what she probably looked like, and that is a chimp. And there we can see the skeletal designs for the hip area, the iliad, the sacrum, and so on, for a walker on four legs. It's very different than a human, which walks on two legs. The design is very different. From what evidence we have, the design is closest, and again, it's fragmented, but it's closest to a chimp. And there you can see actually the chimp walking around, and you can see that the bones of Lucy are placed to some degree to give you an illustration of indeed the long hip with flat iliac blades is what they find evidence for in Lucy. And there you can see for a human, the curved iliac, and it's curved in such a way to where the gluteus medius, the muscle, can attach to the way so it can walk upright comfortably. And there you can see the walking stance is quite different. And therefore the skeleton differences are clear. Other differences as well, uh, chimps and gorillas actually are knuckle walkers where humans have a hand and two hands and two feet, which are designed very differently. And one good example is the top example here is the finger bone they found from Lucy is curved. A human finger bone is not curved. And so therefore, this is one more evidence that indeed the skeleton of Lucy was of a chimp and not of a human. Now, we don't have many examples of this, but from Lucy's species, in fact, they found one fragment from Lucy. And so this gives us some indication of the hand bone. And there we can see Homo sapiens, the fourth metatarsal in this case, from Lucy, which is AL333-160. And then we can see two other examples. So we can see the metatarsal from Lucy is much more similar to the other apes that we have shown here. When we look at the primate feet, again, we can see enormous difference. Chimps, gorillas, orangutans, uh, sire and, and a baboon, we have these five examples. And then you can see the human there, and you can see the enormous difference. And the chart on the other side, again, shows you more examples of animals, and you can see the difference is quite dramatic. Now, ironically, in trying to understand what bones they found, one study concluded that probably Lucy died falling from a tree. <clears throat> Get my water here, my throat hopefully will hold up. So now how can you tell this? By the bones that they found, judging by that, the breaks that were there, they, it indicates that Lucy indeed fell from a tree. This obviously is controversial, but it's one theory. And now we can see there's even movies about Lucy the human chimp. Although this uh, focuses on the research that have been done on chimps, but nonetheless, Lucy is mentioned in this film. And that is the end of the presentation. To try to summarize, and I could go on and give you once more evidence, the book that I wrote does do that. But it shows that from the evidence we have, 
the evidence points out that Lucy was a chimp and not in between a chimp and a man. And why would they conclude this? Well, looking for evidence for human evolution. And as one paleontologist said, this is the best we found. And of course, there are many claims made. All are controversial, including Lucy. In fact, there are a number of very well done paleontological studies that show much more evidence against Lucy as a human chimp link. And so therefore, I conclude, and I conclude from my study, and by the way, there are lots of books that look at human evolution, but most of them are very brief, three, four hundred pages. The one that we did was by far the most well documented, and also it is indeed has thousands of references from the peer-reviewed paleontological literature, and so we are produced the best case indeed that shows that uh, all of the claimed missing links are not missing links, but they are simply chimps or close to it. Now, obviously, if you look at a lot of human skeletons, you can find some that have some link, some uh, uh, missing link traits, some chimp traits, especially the skull area. You can find some people that have traits that look like they're chimp-like. And the same thing with chimps, you find differences. But nonetheless, the contrast between the average is so great that we've concluded, indeed, there's no evidence of a link between humans and our putative claimed evolutionary ancestors. And so that's my presentation, which I made it through. <laughs> and you did a and you did a fantastic job, uh, Dr. Bergman. I appreciate the visuals and I appreciate all the points. Lots of great points. And uh, we've got a ton of great questions. We've got a great uh, live chat right now, uh, roughly uh, 80 people watching live with a ton of questions uh, just flying in for you pertaining to the topic. So I may as well just jump right into some of these questions then, uh, Please do. Dr. Bergman. Okay, so here's... Um, Here's a question that has uh, come in and I can put a lot of them up on screen, like the current ones that have come in, but ones that came in, let's say 20 minutes ago, they may be lost at this point, but uh, here's one from Paleo Logos. I appreciate the uh, question there, uh, Peter. So the question is for you, obviously Dr. Bergman. And he asked, does Dr. Bergman believe that Lucy, Stralopithecus afarensis, is a chimpanzee or simply an ape, a different type of ape unrelated to humans? Uh, probably a chimpanzee, but again, we just don't have enough body parts. The assumption is uh, she was a chimp because, of course, that's the, the current theory that we evolved from chimps. But ironically, if you look at the old paleontological literature, the assumption was more commonly we evolved from gorillas because in many ways we have a lot of traits more in common with gorillas than we do with chimpanzees. But they found there are too many differences between us and gorillas, so the consensus now is that we evolved from chimps. And so that's what the assumption is relative to uh, what Lucy was. But but that's a good question. And I think that's one we need to answer because we need to just conclude, here's the bones and what are those bones closest to in the paleontological record? And what are they closest to relative to living apes? And I have a feeling you might find they're in some ways closer to gorillas or Orangutans was another uh, guess. Orangutans, gorillas, and chimps are the three common guesses that have been used to claim that we evolved from. Of course, now they don't believe we evolved from chimps. The common explanation is, is that chimps and humans have a common ancestor, and we evolved from that common ancestor. But that common ancestor was an ape, and right. so therefore that uh, de 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 denies the point. But on the other hand, we don't know what that common ancestor looked at, looked like. So all we can do is compare it with modern day chimps and conclude, well, it must have been somewhat like in between a chimp and a human. But hey, great question. I love questions, by the way. When they <laughs> taught, I had a hard time when the students sat there and took notes. So I always create a controversy and they asked some questions and class then became enjoyable for me and for them. So Amen. keep well, the questions I coming. 
anybody familiar with this uh, with this channel and the interactive shows we do, uh, we've always got hundreds of questions coming in. So as you put it right, the evolutionists believe that humans and chimpanzees share a, a, a recent common ancestor, maybe between six and 10 million years ago. What that common ancestor looks like exactly, you know, no evolutionist really knows, but it would be uh, some type of ape. And, and one thing I'd like to point out, uh, Dr. Bergman, and get your opinion on it. I find it interesting because the evolutionists will say that the chimpanzee is our closest relative, our closest cousin, right? And yet, and, and yet we find um, a break or an inconsistency in, in their nested hierarchy because when they sequence and compared the Y chromosome, which is non-recombining for the most part DNA, it turns out that the human and gorilla Y chromosome is more similar than the human and the chimpanzee Y chromosome, which was kind of a confusion for the evolutionary community. Have you heard about that? And, and do you have any thoughts on that? Oh yeah, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up because maybe they'll realize that, well, maybe we're closer to gorillas than, than, than chimps. And uh, I've also looked at the evolution of chimps and gorillas, et cetera, and found virtually nothing. They can't figure out where in the world gorillas, chimps, and so on themselves evolved from. And so uh, I need to do a paper on that someday. I've got a file a folder full of articles. And the, basically what I found is, and again, I haven't done exhaustive study, but what I found is, is that they have no idea where chimps evolved from, where gorillas evolved from, or any of the other primates evolved. They have guesses and ideas and so on, but by and large, they admit we don't know. It's funny because I like to dig into the uh, paleoanthropological literature, and I've actually got many books from the evolutionist side just to kind of understand their side better than they do. And a lot of famous paleoanthropologists admit that there's not as much of an incentive in finding, you know, the the big transitional forms linking chimpanzees or gorillas. Everybody wants to find that transitional form in the human line. So there's a lack of, of evidence for what did the chimp evolve from, as you put it, or what did the gorilla evolve from, as you put it, right? Because uh, have you heard of that? And, and what are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. To me, that's an excuse in trying to explain the fact that we can't find evidence. If you're a, a paleontologist, I think any evidence of the evolution of any animal would be useful. And so therefore, uh, you know, we have studies that looked at the evidence of uh, horses from a non-horse and whales from a non-whale, et cetera. So any evidence would be useful, but that's true. A lot focus on human evolution because that's of most interest to most paleontologists and most of us. Amen. Well said. Um, I've got a question here that came in from Faithful, Honest, and True, and the uh, the chat is flying. You know, we've got a really great chat. You're a fan favorite, Dr. Bergman, so I appreciate you being oh. here. Um, I, I do remember essentially what, what what his question was asking, and he's, he's wondering what are your thoughts on uh, these chimeric species or artificial species where we have uh, many in the in the uh, field of paleoanthropology, uh, even admitting that uh, creatures, so-called creatures like Australopithecus sediba, or Homo habilis may actually be the uh, combination of human and ape bones, and therefore not really a, a species. Uh, what What are your thoughts on that? Well, probably it's you probably the combination of different apes. Because I'm not familiar with how apes can interbreed, but we know that, of course, many animals. The best example, of course, is horses, and we can get them to interbreed. And we have uh, zorks and uh, quite a variety of animals that you wouldn't think could interbreed can, but and uh, therefore. It's uh, intriguing that uh, they in the conclude maybe humans did interbreed with chimps. By the way, the experiments have been tried. I did a whole paper on this, one of my books. I published a chapter on this. They try to get apes to interbreed with humans. And ironically, this was done in Africa. And ironically, the scientists who did this concluded that uh, the blacks, the Africans, were closer to an ape than apes were, and therefore they thought they would have the greatest chance of getting a chimera between a chimp or some other ape and humans. And ironically, this was done in a German colony, and the German government said, no way, you're not going to do this. And so back then, of course, they had some different values than they did during Nazi Germany. But uh, so what they did is they lied, and they basically said they were doing just certain examinations on the women, and therefore they attempted to breed by artificial insemination a organism in between a ape and a human and they failed they tried and tried and they failed consistently 
And I understand that people are still trying, although today in our society where you're concerned about racism, I would say that's probably not going to go over too well as uh, we would expect it would. But from what I know, I don't think you'll ever get a chimera between apes and humans. It's just there's too many differences. And what's interesting as well is you have this concept of a false taxon or an artificial species where something like Australopithecus sediba or Homo habilis, which the evolutionists have, you know, held up and, and proclaimed as the perfect uh, intermediate. And yet you have uh, many experts in the field of paleoanthropology, uh, specifically dealing with Sediba. Uh, two that come to mind are Yoel Rack and Ella Ben. They're not even young earth creationists. And they've examined the data and said, no, this is uh, not even a real species. This is due to the accidental mixture in the same bone bed where you've got a human bone here and then you've got a, a, an ape bone here and they've been mixed together. That's a very good point. And there are a number of examples. In fact, that is something you always have to be concerned about, especially when you're looking at skeletons, because often these skeletons were consumed by animals, by wolves, and the bones were dragged to various places. So we may find, I think with Lucy, they found the skeleton parts within quite a wide area, quite several hundred feet, evidently. And therefore, uh, it's you can't even say for sure, although several bones now they've said for sure are not part of Lucy. But on the other hand, it's not easy to determine just because the bones are found in the same area that they're part of the same individual. Hey Amen. So great response. Good point. Great response, Dr. Bergman. So here's another question that comes in from Peter W. I appreciate the question there, Peter W. And he asks, does Dr. Bergman believe Adam and Eve were created, specially created, and therefore were the first humans? And then why? Yeah, that the evidence is pretty clear from what we know about uh, one good evidence is indeed that we know that humans are all basically similar. They used to, evolutionists especially, used to look at differences between the races and, and concluded these were enormous differences. Therefore, humans had several origins. In fact, one theory is that humans evolved from three different eight type apes, one from the gorillas, one from the chimps, and one from the orangutans. And this was held by a number of researchers for a number of years. Now, of course, we see this as silly. We wonder how in the world people ever concluded this, but nonetheless, they did. And therefore, uh, we realize that, yeah, there are differences, but the differences are fairly small. The data depends on what you look at because there's a lot of genetic similarities and there's a lot of gen differences which we find among different people, different people groups. But by and large, you're talking about like 99.1% similarity. So this is why when they do transplants, for example, they're not concerned about race. They're concerned about other factors that are far more important relative to genetic compatibility or uh, other compatibility concerns, histological compatibility concerns. So by and large, the, they realize that. And this is a problem evolutionists have. And so they have to explain this away by the bottleneck theory. The bottleneck theory is that we're evolving into different groups and therefore there are different pre-hominid individuals and something happened, so basically almost all of them are wiped out. So basically we are so similar because all the early pre-humans were wiped out except a small number, maybe 15 or 20 or 30 or 40, and so we are descended from that small number. And so evolutionists would try to explain why in the world we are so similar, why we're not more different, <laughs> and explain that by the, by the bottleneck theory. So they're the ones that have the problem trying to deal with this. Right. We simply look, of course, at the fact that Adam and Eve fathered the entire human race, and that's why there's so many similarities. Of course, one one thing that creationists like to look at is the racism found in evolution, and this is now finally admitted by in fact Science Magazine had an article by a paleontologist from Princeton University, and he basically came out and said clearly. Charles Darwin was a blatant racist, one of the worst racists in history, and he quoted extensively from his writings. Well, in collecting old biology books, which is one of my hobbies, you find that racism was taught in many, many of the books. They typically show a, a chimp, and then a the word they used, of course, was a Negro, and then modern man, Caucasians. And those pictures were supposed to, in the textbook, prove evolution. Here we have evidence for evolution, a chimp, someone in between the 
Negroes, and then modern man. And then often the text or the text would occasionally state that humans, uh, of humans, the highest race, of course, would be the Caucasians. In fact, the Hunter textbook biology that was in the Scopes trial, it had quite a bit on race, openly stating that the most evolved race was the Caucasians, the white Caucasians. And so clearly uh, racism was taught in biology textbooks in our country and other countries for decades after decades. And I have a whole PowerPoint on this. I have many, many pictures. And I present this factually and actually in several black churches. And my wife said, don't you dare present that in these churches. And I got such a positive response. They just said, we're finally recognizing where this racist came from. And a number of people said, I knew this was true. I knew this was taught, but now I can see it all very clearly. In fact, where I presented this information was at a seminary and the director of the seminary, after the presentation, he pulled out his wallet and I knew he was going to give me some money. And I said, no, you've already given me an honorarium. You know, I've, you've already given me that. And he pulled out a hundred dollar bill and he gave it to me. And he said, I want you to take this. No, 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 no. You take this. And so I took that and now I have it on my study under glass. I don't plan on spelling, spending that money very soon. So to me, that's one of the best compliments you could get when you do a presentation. <laughs> they give you a hundred dollar bill. You must have really liked it. And indeed they did. And they found it. And they, a lot of questions, a lot of comments, a lot of dialogue. And so I love to go to various black churches and seminaries because they are an active audience. They're interested in this. They're typically very intelligent about it. And they realize where a lot of these racist ideas came from. And they find it supportive that indeed it was taught in the textbooks for decades. Well, that's a, a fantastic and thorough response, uh, Jerry. It also shows uh, just how dangerous uh, evolutionary uh, theory in that worldview can be. And I love your points about uh, the low genetic variation in, in humans because the evolutionary community never predicted the fact that humans worldwide would be so incredibly similar. I mean, we're all 99.999% the same. And from a biblical starting point, God created two people, Adam and Eve. So that would automatically restrict genetic diversity. That makes sense that we'd have low genetic diversity. But as you put it, the evolutionary community had to invent a post hoc out of Africa population bottleneck hypothesis, which doesn't work for, for so many reasons. So I'm, I'm really glad you pointed that out. That's some great points. So the next question I have here, uh, Dr. Bergman, I've got so many, so I'm just kind of looking through them. And I think this is a good one because we hear this argument so frequently, especially from a lot of the professional evolutionists over at uh, ministries like BioLogos, for example. So the question essentially is set up this way. Evolutionists like to look to the so-called chromosome 2 fusion as evidence for ape-to-man evolution. They purport a fusion of two ape-like chromosomes to explain the differences in human and other primate chromosomes. They will claim that the reputed fusion site contains the expected genetic signs or signal if there really was a fusion. For example, these, these telomeric repeats. What are your thoughts on, on this line of, of argumentation, Jerry? That's often been presented. And of course, that's what you expect is you expect two centromeres, one for each of the original uh, chromosomes. And the reason they look at that, of course, is because apes have one, <laughs> one more chromosome than we have and humans have. And so therefore they expect a fusion to explain the fact that we have one less. And they look for the telomeres and you expect to find one on each end, of course, and two at the fusion site. Plus you expect to find uh, two central mirrors, one on each of the chromosomes. Well, you don't find that. You don't find that at all. What you find in the supposed fusion site is simply a number of genes. The number of them are functional. And then the, those that they claim are central mirrors are not central mirrors. And so therefore, uh, the whole idea is demolished. Of course, you can do that by analyzing the chromosomes, the data you have online. And a, a number of my researchers that I work with did that carefully and found indeed the scientific literature itself showed that that claim is simply false. Uh, but a lot of people still want to hold on to that. And I've often said that evolutionists themselves will prove evolution false by their research. And indeed, if you're objective, you just look at the evidence, you're going to find 
The evidence does not support the evolution idea, and therefore we find, again, in this case, the evidence that scientists found there does not support the evolutionary position. And we've, uh, Jeff Tompkins and I have done several papers on that, thoroughly documenting that indeed that's the case, that there is no fusion site and there's no evidence of evolution by fusion of two chromosomes. Agreed. Fantastic response. I was just spending a, a great deal of time last night actually rereading the uh, number of technical articles that you and uh, Dr. Tompkins have, have put out on that topic. And I find it so fascinating that this so-called re reputed fusion site is actually overlapped by a highly functional gene. And the last time I checked, you don't get highly functional genes by slamming together two, two, two chromosomes. <laughs> Typically, that's pretty deleterious, right? And I find in debating that a lot of evolutionists are not aware of this. I mean, if you study this area, if you look at the data, it's pretty clear. But when you debate evolutionists, they claim, well, there are two fusion sites and there are two you know, telomeres and two telomeres in the center. And so therefore, they're just not aware of it. And so all too often, if they were more aware of the literature, they would not bring up these points, like the 98% I showed in my slide. If you're aware of the data, you know that this is not true. And therefore, the uh, problem is we debate a lot of people, like evolutionists, who may be scholars in their own field, who look at the evolution of turtles and study that carefully, but they really don't understand or don't have the knowledge of other areas. Which well, is with that 98%, uh, Dr. Bergman, are they um, ignoring, for the most part, you know, many gaps, copy number variations, size differences, unalignable regions? Are they accounting for, for any of these things? Well, at first, no, because at first it was an estimate. And at first, I think 99%, then they brought it down to 98%. And therefore, they were looking just, you know, what, what's going on. Now, the problem between comparing chimp and human chromosomes and DNA is, is that there are so many sections that are uncomparable. What do you do with the uncomparable sections? I mean, you can't compare something that are simply not comparable. So we throw them out. So they simply compare the sections that are comparable. And some of these early numbers came from comparing things that were comparable. Of course, the genes to produce a heart in humans and the genes to produce a heart in chimps are going to be very similar because the hearts are very similar. In fact, they're attempting to transplant. I think they're trying to use pigs now, but they're tempted to transplant a heart from a I believe a chimp into a human. This didn't work for a number of reasons, but on the other hand, the design is basically the same. In fact, in uh, when you teach biology, we often, since we don't have human cadavers, we often use a heart from a chimp or other animals. And so therefore you're going to expect a lot of comparison between the parts that are comparable, but you're not gonna find comparison, of course, in the parts that are not comparable. So what do you do with that stuff? You just throw it out. And so therefore, uh, when you look at the whole genome and we try to compare even the relevant parts, you still get an enormous amount of difference. And that makes for a massive waiting time problem, uh, Dr. Bergman, because when you're looking at somewhere between two and 400 million DNA differences, well, the question is how can we fixate, you know, fixate me meaning to get stuck in place that many differences in just six to 10 million years since the hypothetical split. So that's a great point, uh, Jerry. And the next question that comes in here is from Andrew Cumming. I've got it up on screen and he asks a question for Dr. Bergman. What do you mean by missing link? And uh, how are you defining, defining it here? I think he's referring back to your presentation. Yeah, missing link is an interesting term because a lot of these missing links we have in books titled missing links. Well, if you find it, it's no longer a missing link, and therefore the term is outdated. But what we refer to usually in missing link is a link which links us with chimps, an in, a individual which is somewhat in between us and chimps, which has some human traits and some chimp traits. And so that's usually what they're looking for is these in between, which, of course, if you find a link, it's no longer missing. There it is. But uh, the term missing link is still often used because that's what we use it. That's what we refer to. Same as Lucy. Well, I use the term Lucy. Most people do, even though we're not sure if it's a man or woman. Some evidence indicates it's a male, but we use it because, well, people recognize what we mean when we talk about Lucy. When we talk about that, 
the Australopithecus afarensis. That's a good point. I appreciate the answer there, uh, Dr. Bergman. This next question that comes in here has to do with um, classification systematics, really, when it comes to fossil specimens. So the question is, uh, Jerry, when looking at a fossil, are there some defining characteristics we can use to tell whether this is human or an ape, or would the evolutionists like to say a non-human ape, since they believe humans are, are apes, essentially? Um, well, yeah, you try to look at things that you know are very different, like the location where the spinal cord goes into the brain below the occipital area. So you try to find these differences. And this is a good example because this is very dramatically different. Obviously, there are some, some areas that are very similar. Some of the bones are very similar. The humerus bone is quite similar between humans and apes. So you can't, you can't use some of these to make comparisons. So basically, what you're trying to do is look at the key differences. And hip bones, of course, are very important. And so there's a two, two or three dozen differences you look at, and therefore you make comparisons based on these, because obviously there's no point in comparing every single bone because there are some that are not that different. And so you have a, a key factors, about 12 or 14, that they look at to try to make judgments relative to whether a skeleton is an, an ape, a human, or something in between. Good question, though. That's a great response, uh, Dr. Bergman. Well, that brings me to this next important question then, and it has to do with these nested hierarchical patterns that evolutionists like to look to. And they will say humans and chimpanzees are more like each other than humans and monkeys or humans and dogs. In other words, the question would come down to why are we more similar in genetics and anatomy with, let's say, the chimpanzee than with you know, another form of life, like a dog or even a, a lemur? Well, that's because when you do taxonomy, you're looking for similarities. And uh, if chimps weren't around, if you didn't have any chimps, living chimps around, you would still find this nested hierarchy. And even if no apes were around, you could still find evidence of a nested hierarchy that would place us similar to some other animals. I'm not sure what, but on the other hand, you would still find it. But uh when you look at the variety of life today, it's enormous, and therefore you can group together based on nested hierarchy beliefs. But, you know, that doesn't prove anything just because there's a nested hierarchy. That's one way of classifying us, of course, as primates. But then again, so many of the primates look more like squirrels than they do like primates. And so, therefore, even that classification is not as useful as ideal. Uh, the original classification systems were developed a long time ago. And uh, in the 7, 16, 1700s, and therefore we were stuck with some of those because, well, once we start a system, we hard to change it, hard to say, well, all these terms are different. Anatomy, they've done that. There's so many terms that I learned, and all of a sudden they're not used anymore, like the fallopian tube. That's not the fallopian tube anymore. They call it the, the uterine tube. Some other term, I <laughs> find these confusing because so many terms have changed. And I like the old term. And of course, the old term is found in many books. But when you teach anatomy today, you try to use the new terms. But often I just use the old term anyways, because I'm more familiar with that. And then the uterine tube, which is probably makes more sense because Dr. Fallopi has been not with us for many, many generations. So he was the one who, of course, discovered some of this and named it. And so kind of nice to name parts after the discoverer. That way they get some recognition for what they've done. And it makes it easier to remember who discovered the fallopian tube. Well, Dr. Right. Fallopi did. That's an interesting thing. But. Yeah, that's an interesting point. That's such a fantastic uh, point you made there, Dr. Bergman. When it comes to the uh, evolutionary story and nested hierarchies, if the chimpanzee did not exist, or let's say the chimpanzee and the bonobo, well, they would just say, okay, we're most related to the gorilla. And so we're more similar to the gorilla than we are to a lemur or a dog. If the gorilla didn't exist, you know, then we're most similar to, uh, you know, an old world monkey or, or, or a new world monkey. So regardless, there's always going to be something that humans are most similar to. So it, it's not really good evidence for uh, common descent. So I, I'm really glad you made, a, made that point. And I'll say this, you gave a fantastic presentation uh, recently on Neanderthals. And I really enjoyed it. And, and you brought up so many good points. And so this is a good question that, that comes in here. I've got it up on screen 
from the Orthodox Moor. And he asks, Dr. Bergman, what is the best explanation for Neanderthal and Homo sapien interbreeding? I think they interbred without a problem. Uh, Neanderthals, of course, were the missing link for Jenner Hare, I'm using that term again, <laughs> for years. And uh, in fact, many of the books that they didn't have, quote, Negroes, again, I don't like that term, but that's the term they use. So they don't have a Negro, they have a Neanderthal. So Neanderthal is commonly shown as a missing link between us and apes. But of course, now we know that if you put a suit on him and comb his hair and have him dress up, he looks just like somebody else walking down the street. And therefore, uh, we know, and the National Geographic did a whole story on this, and did a good job. And they basically pointed out, Neanderthals are us. They are simply another group of people, another people group, another race, and they would fit in without a problem, give them an education, uh, put them through American society, and they would blend in without a problem. And of course, we have found people around, I've collected pictures of people who uh, really have very strong Neanderthal traits. And every now and then I see someone who has clearly looks like a Neanderthal and you dress him up like a Neanderthal and he would fit in the pictures perfectly well. And so therefore, uh, it's a lot of reading into body parts, which like the eyebrows. But uh, when you look at the whole person, et cetera, brain size, of course, Neanderthals is slightly on the average larger than ours, on, as far as we know. And therefore, uh, Neanderthals are just another people group that can interbreed without a problem. That's a great answer. And I highly recommend your presentation on Neanderthals. Uh, they were obviously a very sophisticated people group. I mean, they buried their dad. They were into cosmetics. They had purposeful navigation and we could go on and on and on. So the question is, and I actually watched a recent lecture just a few months ago from uh, not a young earth creationist, a paleoanthropologist who actually made the point that you just made. And he uh, very firmly and adamantly said, Neanderthals are us just a little different. And he said, um, you know, flat out that we are the same species and not a separate species. So my question to you then, Jerry, is um, what's the best explanation for why Neanderthal genetics are slightly different than human genetics? As in, I believe they're about 99.7% rather than uh, the 99.99% .99 similar that we all are. The best explanation is that when you compare any two people groups, you do find differences because we, I come from a long line of, of Germans and Finns, and therefore I have certain characteristics. And when I signed up for 23andMe, they were able to determine how much Finn DNA I had, how much, you know, I had primarily Scandinavian DNA, how much German, and they found a few other uh, groups in my DNA. And so any people group, and of course I'm from a long line of Finns and Germans, and so therefore I have a lot of these traits in common. But they also, when my wife had 23andMe, analysis done, she found that she had significant Ashkenazi Jew in her background. And so we're not saying that Jews are genetically different. We're saying that interbreeding, intermixture for centuries has caused similarities to appear. And so therefore, certainly we would expect the same thing with Neanderthals. In fact, when they did my DNA and many people, I, a number of people I know, their DNA, I have more Neanderthal DNA than I do a number of other groups. And so indeed they found some DNA, which is typical of, not a lot, but they found a little bit, which is typical of Neanderthals and that DNA they found in my genome. And so that's how they can do this. They can trace pretty much what area you came from, not only from Germany, but Western Germany or Northern Germany. Uh, sometimes they can, they can trace you back to a city like Dusseldorf or Ham Hamburg and, uh, and of course, if you marry people from other areas, then of course, they'll find so much Hamburg DNA and so much Dusseldorf DNA and so on. So uh, that's how they can do these experiments. Uh, that's how they determine your genealogy. And therefore, uh, you expect the same thing is true with uh, us and Neanderthal. And you'd expect more because, of course, it's been a long time since us and Neanderthals interbred. And so you'd expect more. It hasn't been in my family that long since Germans and the uh, Finns interbred, and so therefore I have both DNAs in my system. My father was Finnish and my mother was largely German. So that's uh, the story. 
That's another great answer. I appreciate how thorough your answers are to these great questions. And I like to point out to these critics what I believe is, is the obvious, Dr. Bergman. And that is when it comes to the Neanderthals, they are an extinct people group. They were highly inbred uh, based on the data we now have regarding them. Their rungs of, of homo zygosity were massive. And uh, as you pointed out, they were, uh, they were closer to the flood. They were an example of ancient man. And so they would have already possessed a different set of biodiversity. You know, why would we expect them to be 99.99% similar to us, given all of these, uh, I think, data points? So, um, okay, so great points there. I'm looking at these questions and, okay, here's the next one I got. I'll put it up on screen. Uh, you talked about the Laetoli footprints, Dr. Bergman, in, in your presentation. And uh, I've heard evolutionists assert that uh, these footprints, when examined and analyzed, they exhibit a transitional stride that's not quite human and not quite that of an extant ape, like a human or like a, a chimpanzee or a gorilla. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I would say rescue device to try and say, well, it, it's not you know, fully human. It's more of an intermediate. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's if you could just find that they're human-like and ape-like, that would be a, a finding. But of course, uh, in walking in now, that I'm not sure how how it is like to walk in this in this volcanic ash and how old it was, et cetera, and whether the conditions, because of course this was found on a layer of topsoil, so they had to remove the topsoil. So you're looking at distortions. In fact, some of these they re-looked at again later, and they found different than what they indicated earlier. And so it's pretty hard to determine much from them, except, of course, the, the difference between the major differences between humans and chimps. That's pretty clear. But by and large, uh, it, some of them look like they only had two toes. And so some of them kind of look like an ostrich uh, di difference. And so it's hard to judge from footprints that are indeed quite old. And so uh, I'm not sure how you can tell much by the stride. Uh, and they only, you know, they only had a few individuals walking around. Maybe they had a foot injury or something. Maybe they uh, been spending so many years of arthritis. So there could be a lot of reasons why you get the data that you got. Well, right there is the perfect response, Dr. Bergman, because I've seen a lot. I've done a lot. I've interacted with a lot of these militant critics. And uh, the Laetoli footprints demonstrate what? That anatomically modern uh, looking humans must have been around at that point. And according to the evolutionary model, that could not have been the case because this was essentially millions of years ago. They have this circular line of reasoning. And so they've said, well, the, the, the stride is intermediate. But like you pointed, it, pointed out, I mean, walking through the, the, those conditions or if you were to check my stride at the beginning of the day and then let's say I went to work for 12 hours and then tested my stride at the end of the day, you're probably going to find some, some variations there. So I, I don't find that to be a good argument or, or criticism. Um, so here's the next question that, that comes in and I'm trying to find it. we got a hundred people live right now watching uh, Dr. Bergman. So uh, fantastic information you're, you're providing us. And this one comes in from Paleo Logos. Uh, this one looks like it's it's a little bit uh, specific, and and he's asking about uh, your your thoughts. If you've looked at uh, this, is a newer finding when it comes to I think the technical name is Australopithecus Prometheus, um, if if I'm correct on uh, Littlefoot. And he's asking, what are your thoughts on on some of the foot bones that that were found? He's saying these indicate that Australopithecines had a big toe that was not as divergent as as chimps. Have you, have you done any research into this specific um, uh, finding, Dr. Yeah, Burton? exactly. The footprints that we have were worn down. And so, therefore, you only get the bottom of the foot. You don't get a lot of details about other parts of the foot. And, therefore, that's that's a difference. Also, I should notice that. I'm not sure why, but I walk on my sides for some reason. I know that because of the wear on my shoes. If you look at your shoes, it tends to wear not equally across the whole shoe, but more on one side than on the other side. And so that's an individual trait. And of course, whenever you have a N of one, it's very hard to make conclusions. You need a good sample. You need several hundred footprints to make indeed a good determination. And I find they're so anxious to read all kinds of things into what they find that you have to be somewhat skeptical. And that's one thing that paleontologists criticize other paleontologists for is they say, yeah, you see a lot of 
evidence and, and merit with this trait, but I don't. And so therefore they de-emphasize it. I appreciate that response, Dr. Bourbon. I got a couple people in the chat asking, it looks like there's some scratching noise or something possibly coming in on your end that is okay, but it was kind of, um, uh, and that's my dog. It's kind of hard to hear you. Okay. It's your dog. <laughs> no worries. It, it kind of uh, drowned out your answer a bit. No yeah, worries at all. My dog wants to get on TV with you guys. <laughs> yeah. He, he wants to, he wants to be famous. He, he we can he get likes, him in. He said, he, yeah. everywhere we go, people say, what a cute dog. <laughs> man's best friend um now is, is is he a young earth creationist at least he's, he's oh, not another <laughs> um okay so here's the next question that that comes in this one's from andrew cumming and uh short and sweet he, he's asking have you heard of artipithecus ramidus oh, and yeah. essentially we, we, would you say uh arty is is good evidence for evolution uh, Artie is one of the worst examples that I've seen. And there's a lot of research done, even by paleontologists that point out that Artie is a, is a big problem. And uh, I don't have the data in front of me, but I know there are several studies that I've read that claim that this is pretty weak evidence for evolution. I need I didn't write the ch chapter on Artie in my book, by the way. So that would be Peter Lyons' research. So he looked at that. Well, thank you for that response, uh, Jerry. As, as we start to wind down here, because I did just look at the clock and uh, time flies by with you. You are a wealth of information. And, uh, you know, I, I really hope we can have you on again in the in the future, because, again, you're clearly a fan favorite. We, we've had roughly 100 people uh, engaging in, in this conversation in, in the live chat. So let's kind of wind it down here with the last couple questions that came in. And this one comes in from Chris Peacock. And he asks, if we are made in the image of God, why are we why are we more bacteria than human? Because bacteria are so, so incredibly small. Yeah, statistically, you find that we're in, what, 90% bacteria, but they're so incredibly small, and there's so many of them that, yeah, in many ways, we are more bacteria, but those bacteria serve very important roles. And we didn't understand that until recently, that indeed bacteria are necessary for good health, and that's called probiotics. In fact, they found some studies are that we have too many of the wrong bacteria, and therefore we need more of the right bacteria that will take up the room of the wrong bacteria. And so uh, the numbers, of course, doesn't mean much, of course, when you look at the number of cells. But yeah, these I've heard these at my thought when I taught microbiology, they said we're 90% bacteria and 10% people, but I'm not sure how accurate those numbers are, but those are things that are thrown around in microbiology for years. That's a great response. I, I, I find that when people hear about bacteria or even viruses, they tend to think of something that's bad. When in fact, both bacteria and, and viruses, you wouldn't want to live in a, in a world without bacteria and viruses. You know, they're essential and uh, oftentimes necessary to sustain healthy life processes in, in the cell. So it, it's not a good assumption to, to, to automatically think, OK, bacteria means something bad. And, and the same goes for viruses. So the vast majority um, of both are beneficial. Amen. Amen. And you know what? To make this uh, just a, an absolute complete dismantling of human evolution, I've really enjoyed this. This has been great. And um, one of their, I want to get this one in here because one of their go to lines of evidence, again, uh, especially with the uh, professional evolutionists, they'll say, well, you know, humans and chimpanzees share uh, genetic mistakes or pseudogenes or, you know, junk DNA sequences. And therefore, they'll say we must have inherited those genetic mistakes from a common ancestor. Uh, do you find this to be a good line of argumentation? Uh, no, because a lot of these so-called mistakes we find are not mistakes, number one. And number two, we find there's going to be similarities and mistakes because there's similarities in the genes and there's what they call hot spots and hot, hot spots means that you have mutations in certain areas. And so you can compare genes from humans and chimps and find the hot spots in both and find mutations occur at the same place in both. And that's why we have research studies. They look at cancer, not only among people, but among animals and they find the similar hot spots and therefore similar genetics is genetic areas between the two. And so now I know that a number of researchers try to claim this is evidence for uh, evolution. It's like uh, you have a mistake, you know, the example they give is a mistake in a paper. And if I copy that paper, plagiarize it from you, and then I have the same mistake. 
And of course, that would prove that my paper actually came from your paper. And that's why the mistakes are the same in both papers. And that seems logical when you're talking about mistakes in papers, but by and large, that has not held up very well. Although it's been popular for a few years, but that hasn't held up very well in the scientific literature because they realize these so-called mistakes do not necessarily show a common ancestor. What they show is commonality in the genome because of hotspots. Amen. I, I completely agree. Um, so is this in your opinion, because I know you've done a lot of work on vestigial organs. Is this kind of like the new take on vestigial organs? And they know that, that those uh, have been overturned for the most part. So now they're looking to vestigial genes. And now we know a lot of those are functional as well. Yeah, that when they, an argument is shown wrong, one way of resurrecting it is finding similarities. And of course, the vestigial argument, which was one time over 100 vestigial organs, but now there are no confirmed examples of vestigial organs in the human body and in other bodies as well, as far as we know. And so therefore, the argument was a good argument. I mean, how could you claim that God created us and put all this junk in our body, all these organs that don't work? That indicates evolution because we evolved from organisms that these things did work. And so for that doesn't support creation because God would not make bodies with all these mistakes, these useless organs in it. So it's a good argument. It worked for quite a while, but now that we know that all these organs that are vestigial, were vestigial, are not vestigial, and therefore they you know, try to find some other argument, so they look at vestigial genes. And so mm -hmm. this is the next popular argument. So evolutionists, of course, have to constantly chase the claims because once they're refuted, they've got to come on to something else. And when you see the world through evolutionary glasses, you're looking for evidence of evolution. And if you look hard enough, I guess you find it. And they do. And that gives us, gives me something to do to write another paper proving their <laughs> arguments are wrong. Amen. And, and I love your papers and articles. I spent a great amount of time reading through them and, and studying them. How would you respond to an evolutionist who would, who would say this in response to uh, the vestigial organ uh, counter argument from a creationist? They'll say, well, we never predicted that these vestigial organs would have no function. It's that they would have either a reduced function or maybe have adopted a, a novel or, or different function. Yeah, well, that's a common argument used now to avoid embarrassment, but actually <laughs> they, they did use the claim, and this in the literature, they did use the claim that these don't have any function, that not only has no function, but also has a problem, causes disease like the appendix. And so they can claim, well, the appendix doesn't have the function it used to have, and so therefore it is still vestigial. But by and large, the word vestigial does not mean a different function or less important function. It simply means it's it's a remnant of what used to be and has no function or almost no function. And so uh, it's a way of trying to avoid the embarrassment of <laughs> claiming that indeed uh, they still exist. So yeah, that's commonly used, but that's, uh, and I, in my books, I don't claim that they always claim they had no function. I often claim they have, they often claim they had less function and I try to prove, indeed, they don't have less function, but they have an equal, if not more important function than the organs in, did in the past. Amen. Amen. Well said. They've they've had to redefine <laughs> what a vestigial organ or structure is after they, uh, you know, were shown, unfortunately, to be uh, completely wrong and in error on that. Uh, this one comes in in the form of a, of a super chat or a donation is, is what we call it here. A logical, plausible, probable. And he he's asking, um, do you have copyright control of your books? If so, would you be interested in having some audio books created? So it looks like we're, we're dealing with somebody who uh, is interested in, in turning some of your books into an audio book. Uh, some of them do, I believe, but not, I'm not sure because the publisher takes care of all this. They mm. determine a lot of what, the book goes online when it goes online whether it's a kindle edition whether it's an audio etc and i'm really not sure as far as i know there are nuns but of course i have copyright control so therefore if a someone is interested in making audio books fine i'll be glad to cooperate just contact me care of you be fine awesome i I appreciate, especially nowadays, people are doing a lot of traveling. They're on the road a lot. It, it's always helpful and, and convenient to uh, listen uh, rather than read. 
And um, I guess here's my final question and, and then we'll wrap it up. I really appreciate you giving me an hour and a half of your time, Dr. Bergman. This has been a real blessing. Uh, we now have, have over a hundred people in the live chat. So again, uh, you're well-respected and your, your answers, your thorough answers, I really appreciate them. Um, this is kind of related to the junk DNA argument again, because now evolutionists will say, well, we have these uh, endogenous retroviruses that, that are shared between humans and, and chimpanzees. And uh, they'll say that these are the ancient remnants of past viral infections that have been passed down. But from my uh, study, I've uh, discovered paper upon paper now showing that these uh, endogenous retroviral-like elements are actually um, functional. They're functional in the embryo, they're functional in gene expression, determining cell types. They actually act as antiviral protectors, which is interesting. So would you, uh, hold to the same argument then that uh, these shared endogenous retroviral sequences are um, derived from this uh, faulty junk DNA uh, assumption? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would concur with you that indeed they're finding more and more of these do have a fun function and that they're not just junk DNA that got in there because of an infection in the past. And But you would expect that some viruses, of course, have similarity between our genes because virus can get in your cells and it's got the equipment to read your cell and use its genes using your cellular equipment to make copies of itself. So you're gonna find some similarities. But on the other hand, the DNA is so enormous. You have so many miles and miles of DNA. You're gonna find some differences if you look and you'll find some similarities likewise if you look and so therefore they look a lot, they find some similarities, and of course, because there are similarities, doesn't it all mean that indeed we got that from a viral infection that occurred when we were still apes? So that's, a, to me, that's a very specious argument, but when you're scraping the bottom of the barrel, you kind of have to find <laughs> what you can. And it's funny because they want to avoid the massive differences like going back, you know, 45 minutes ago when we were talking about the Y chromosome, which when you uh, consider overall size differences, architecture and gene content, Dr. Bergman, you're looking at a Y chromosome that's really only about 35 percent the same between humans and chimpanzees. How do they account for those massive differences? I'd like to know. A lot of evolution. There's a lot, a lot of between. Hyper evolution is what they'll say in their technical papers. And yeah. that is a code for, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, here we go. Great, uh, great chat, great presentation. I want to encourage people in the audience to uh, please share this around. Uh, we've had a really, really great audience with so many fantastic questions. Dr. Bergman, I really appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. Uh, you really are a blessing and a warrior in, in the world of creation versus evolution. So I want to hand it to you for some final thoughts, final words, and thank you again for doing this. Okay, thank you. And uh, check on Amazon. All my books are on Amazon. Also, there's a website, uh, Crevo Evo, Creation Evolution, which I have about 230 articles on now. So if you look under my name, Creation Evolution, and my name, you will find the website on uh, David Coppedge, he's the director of it, C-O-P-P-E-D-G-E. -E. So if you type his name in, you'll get uh, a lot of information. And Creation Safari, Safari is another website that I have a lot of work on. And so... Uh, it's there. So it's nice to know when people read my books and get on my website. And because you wonder, I work so hard writing these books, and I wonder how many people read them. <laughs> well, well I can tell you, people do. I can tell you a lot because uh, we're going on an hour and a half and we still have 105 people here live, uh, really enjoying this content. And this was uh, very uh, thorough. I'm really, really happy with this. We dealt with, uh, you know, their best so-called icons. We dealt with pseudogenes, chromosome two fusion, endogenous retroviruses, nested hierarchies. So uh, in my opinion, that means uh, evolution dismantled and essentially it's, it's time to convert you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, I, I appreciate those uh, final words, Dr. Bergman. Uh, to the audience, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been a ton of fun. And thank you so much for being uh, just so engaged in, in tonight's conversation. Uh, standing for Truth is out. God bless all. Okay, we are live. And I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. I am your host, Donnie. And we at Standing for Truth are dedicated to defending the truth 
of biblical creation. We also host debates, interviews, lectures, and more. And so if you enjoy this content, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. And please share around this content as the truth is so incredibly important. Now, one of the many ways we defend the truth of biblical creation is by inviting and hosting some really awesome guests on the program here. And today it is an honor and a privilege to have Dr. Jerry Bergman here once again with me for another important show. Jerry was here last month for a presentation and discussion on human evolution, specifically apes as ancestors. This was a comprehensive program. Therefore, anybody who has not yet seen it, please check it out. We touched on so many uh, important topics, the hominid fossil record, Lucy, pseudogenes, uh, endogenous retroviruses, chromosome two fusion, and more. Uh, Dr. Bergman, thank you so much uh, again for giving us your time for this important show. Now, before we uh, get into the presentation for for this evening, I do want to give our guest a brief introduction, and, and then we're just going to get right into his PowerPoint presentation, and then we're also going to make this interactive like we did last time. So guys in the audience, if you have questions, please make sure you're tagging me. I've already got some questions here in, in the side, uh, so just make sure you're tagging me at Standing for Truth, and uh, that way I won't miss them. Okay, so our guest... Uh, Dr. Jerry Bergman has taught biology, genetics, chemistry, biochemistry, anthropology, geology, and microbiology for over 40 years at several colleges and universities, including Bowling Green State University, Medical College of Ohio, where he was a research associate in experimental pathology, and the University of Toledo. He is a graduate of the Medical College of Ohio, Wayne State University in Detroit, the University of Toledo, and Bowling Green State University. He has over 1,300 publications in 12 languages and 40 books in monographs. His books and textbooks that include chapters that he authored are in over 1,500 college libraries in 27 countries. So far, over 80,000 copies of the 40 books and monographs that he has authored or co-authored are in print. Um, also, I've got uh, various links in the description box where you can find more about Dr. Bergman, including his many must-read articles uh, that he has written. One specific book that I have behind me that I highly recommend is Fossil Forensics. Okay, that being said, uh, Dr. Bergman, I wanna hand it over to you um, and we can kind of just get right into the show and the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. It's good to be here. Let me get the uh, slides up. Okay, you can see them? Yes, looks great. And I should mention, by the way, this is all now standard. There's nothing controversial whatsoever about this presentation. This is among those who are aware of this issue and includes National Geographic. And of course, National Geographic says it, so it must be true. I'm being a little bit facetious there, but I will show you that in a minute. And Neanderthals, they were for a century an evolutionary link between apes and us. And now, guess what? We have now shown beyond any question to anyone who has some knowledge about this, that they are our brothers. This is a picture by a great French anthropologist, Boulle, and he depicted Neanderthal man, as you can see in this picture. And this is the picture which has been produced throughout the world in many textbooks and so on. Very ape-like, obviously, very uh, stooped, hairy, short man. And this, by the way, now this surprises me because this is a 1996 children's book, and they still picture Neanderthals as primitive ape-like men. And this surprised me because, come on, by this time, it was very clearly confirmed that Neanderthals are not like an ape. And another picture, you notice how different they are. This is Pithocanthropus alias, and this was done by uh, Ernst Haeckel in Germany. And you can see that they are very, again, ape-like, but how different they are when people try to draw them. And this is because, of course, they're drawn according to the artist's conception of what they look like. We had no direct evidence of what they look like, at least back at this time. 
And this is two statues which were found at the Chicago Field Museum. And this is uh, memorable for me because I saw those when I was a young kid. And also when I did a presentation there, one of the persons in the audience said, yeah, I used to work there and I remember these. And now they're up in the attic of the Field Museum in Chicago, one of the most uh, prestigious leading museums in the world. So it was pretty prominent having these displayed. And I would love if creationists could buy these and display them in our museums to show you what they were pictured as looking like about 50 years or so ago. Textbooks, we can see this is one of many, many examples I have, hundreds, but I'll just show you a couple. And this, you can see the three stages of human development. You can see the Java man at the far uh, right, and then uh, left from your viewpoint, and then, uh, Cro-Magnon man, and then, of course, Neanderthal man in the middle. And Cro-Magnon would be the most evolved. And in the middle is good old Neanderthal man. Another example, another picture. This is probably more realistic in a sense because it shows what they were ideally supposed to look like. Modern man, very modern. Neanderthal man, very much in between the gorilla and modern man. And so this is an artist's conception of where Neanderthals were. And I should mention Neanderthals were one of the strongest proofs of evolution, human evolution, for over a century. And here you can see another picture in the top is modern man, then Piltdown, of course, which has been shown to be a fraud in the, the jaws shown here, and then orangutans. And then the picture in the, the other side, we can see a gorilla, Neanderthal man, and modern man. And then a picture, a drawing showing the various missing links. And you can see at the highest form, the highest in the picture was white and then Mongol and then Australian. And then you can see Neanderthal is below those three I just mentioned. And so therefore Neanderthal is again shown as a picture of uh, a missing link. And this is again from a textbook. By the way, most of these have been shown to be not at all what they are, or they've been shown to be frauds like Piltdown or problematic like Peking Man and the Java man and Heidelberg man. And so it's interesting, the major links in evolution have now been shown to be pretty much false. Or as you can see the Mongol up here, now this surprises me to have a Mongol in this picture because usually they show, believe it or not, they show a gorilla and then they show a Negro and then they show a Caucasian guy. And for a century, the uh, blacks were in the middle. They were seen as missing links. They were seen as proof of evolution. And I have many examples of that as well in my other PowerPoints. And so one thing that's clear that evolution was for over a century, probably the, one of the racist ideas found in science or anywhere else. And I like to show these because you can see how indeed re racist we were at one time endeavoring to prove evolution. And here again, you can see the skulls and uh, Neanderthal is number two. You have a side view and then a front view. And then of course, modern man you see at the bottom of the picture. And there's another drawing. This is at the uh, museum in uh, uh, at, uh, Harvard, I believe Harvard University or no, Yale University. You can see the picture of the brute, very ape-like early Neanderthal and, and he's got his family. They show his family there, but this is actually better than some because he looks fairly modern aside from the, the face. And here's another example. And you can see again, how brutal he looks very brutal, very brute like. And, uh, and then the next picture, I show a 1888 drawing by professor Schaffhausen, a German scientist. And there we can see a, a picture of what he was supposed to look like. And how do they show this historically? Well, what they've done in many cases is they rearrange the data. And this is actually a common example. You can see the arrow, the blue arrow on the one picture. You can see where the jaw hinge should be. And you can see when it's moved over, it's moved over towards the front. So the jaw is protruded forward. You can see then they, from this picture, they can get a, a very ape-like appearance. 
And so this was commonly done. In fact, I've seen this on many other models and so on. They, they do not put the jaw where it belongs in the hinge, the hinge uh, centerpiece. And other traits, thick brow, you can see, which actually I would think would be pretty useful today because they would be very protective. So many injuries hurt the eye and this thick brow would help protect the eye against injuries. So from an evolutionary standpoint, we should have retained that indeed if that was the case. Stocky build, they made good football players. They're maybe five, four, five, five, quite strong, quite powerful. And you can see this picture uh, shows that. Neanderthal population, when you look at the population, according to evolutionists, they say Neanderthals lived from 130,000 years to about 30,000 years ago. And this would mean there was a huge population of Neanderthals. In fact, they estimate you're talking about 2,500 generations. So there is a lot of generations and therefore there should be a lot of fossils. About, they estimate, estimated 6 billion. Now it might only be far less than that, but on the other hand, it's a lot of fossils. Now we actually have a fair number of Neanderthal fossils because many were found in caves. They weren't buried. And therefore, because they lived and were stored in, stored the bodies in caves when they died, we have a fairly good large number uh, of them. So we have a good idea of what indeed they look like. And, uh, but we don't have in fossils that you would expect if indeed they live for hundreds of millions of years that they claim they used to live. One book by Jack Crusoe, he talked about uh, Neanderthals and why they had some of the features they had. And he concluded because as we age, the jaw and the facial features, as well as the whole skeleton system, changes shape. And the best example I can think of is I wear glasses. And where my glasses fit on my ear, we can see the skull is significantly indented. And it is indented at that position because of wearing glasses and the skull therefore is reformed, it changed. It uh, is somewhat malleable. And as a result, Jack and his, he's a dentist by the way, and Jack basically in his research concluded that the features we see on Neanderthal are partially a result of simply living to be very old. And it was had nothing to do with their innate abilities or tasks or traits. It had to do everything with the fact that they lived for Jack claimed for a long time. And therefore the traits changed. Long time, I'm not sure what he estimated, but probably 200, 150, 200, 300 years. And so it was a fairly long time. And he used the cephalometric examination he examined the bones and found in French, in France, and uh, as a result, he felt that this supported his conclusions about the uh, facial traits of Neanderthals. And now we can see here is a skeleton of a Neanderthal and the skeleton of a modern man. First thing you'll notice is the height differences are fairly significant. Now, how are they able to assemble this skeleton? They have a complete skeleton. Well, they have enough bones from various sites that they were able to put them together. At one site, they didn't have a complete skeleton, but several sites, they were able to put together a complete skeleton and they produced the skeleton that you see there. And you can see the differences between the two different groups. You can see the barrel chested of Neanderthals, the flatter, thinner chest of modern humans. You can see the legs were shorter more robust, stronger, and so on. So you see a number of traits, which indeed are shown in the skeleton, which show indeed that they were a different ethnic group. And then the next step was, is to take these bones and to put flesh on them. And this is done by people who take uh, bones, and forensics usually, and they put flesh on them. And a good example, one of my favorite, is a woman disappeared in California and uh, had no sign of her for I think about six years, six, seven years. And they found some skeletons, some remains in a park two states away. And they took those remains and from them, they were able to do this technique, as you see here, put a flesh on them. And then they basically put what they found on TV, the picture of what they found, the flesh on the bones. 
and primarily the skull, of course, and someone was able to identify the woman who happened to be, I believe, from Cambodia originally, and they were able to locate where she lived, and they found out that she disappeared about six, seven years ago. It was her neighbor, by the way, who said, oh, that was my neighbor. Yeah, she's my neighbor. I knew her very well, and this looks exactly like her. And so they're able to convict the husband of murder as a result of this building the flesh on this skeleton. And so it's a good example of how detailed and how accurate they now are in putting flesh on the bones. And here we can see the profile. Again, they're putting flesh on the bones. And there we've got more flesh. And then the last step is skin. And the next step, of course, is some coloration. And here we can see now the built-in part, the added part, plus the skeleton. And you can see how it was done. Now, from this skeleton, we have been able to produce a fit, quite an accurate picture of what Neanderthals look like. And we can see here this picture of a bald man. And then we can compare that to the picture drawn in 1888. And you can see a world of difference. The difference is science produced the one model and an artist's conception and our belief in evolution produce the other model. And you can see enormous difference between the two. Very, very obvious. And when you put clothes on him, and we see here, this guy's got a nice hairdo. It's combed neatly. And he has a suit and a tie on. And this is a display in Germany. And basically they say he is all dressed up and no place to evolve. <laughs> and this is what they said. I'm not saying this. This is what they said by the, the picture. And so they, I think to some degree, they were mocking the idea that their poor person who lived in Neander, Neander Valley has been pictured as a evolutionary link, and he is no such. Another picture, again, done the same way, except this was a young girl. And they can see, you can see that when flesh was put on her, you can see how she looks just like, well, the girl next door. Now, she could use a, a new suit of clothes. It's not very stylish what she's wearing. And she could certainly use a haircut or at least her hair combed. But on the other hand, she looked very much like a modern young girl, about, oh, I guess eight or nine years old is what she's supposed to be. And this is another reconstruction of a Neanderthal. In fact, that looks like a photograph of a person, as this does. And when I used to teach anthropology, I uh, mentioned, is this a real girl? Is it a photograph or is it a drawing? What is it? And they would say, well, it's, it's a girl. It's just a girl and she's wearing this funny uh, clothes and this poor hairdo. And so they didn't see her as being any different than any girl that would walk around today. The same thing with this man. This is not, not a photograph of a man. This is where they took the skull bones and built a man flesh and beard and so on on him. And now we can see fully the glory of the difference. We can see the person put on the skeleton and we can see what Neanderthal looked like and what a modern human looked like. And we can see that Neanderthals were very strong, made great football players. And I wouldn't want to meet a Neanderthal in a dark alley. Well, if I did, I'd be very polite to him <laughs> because he doesn't look like someone you want to get into the wrong side of the, the day with him. And so, uh, but very, very human. Now, why were they so, so bulky, so large? Well, because at this time in Europe, they had a cold spell and therefore those with the thicker bodies were more apt to survive the very cold weather. And as a result, we had a tendency for this flesh to develop. This, by the way, is called Bergman's rule, not named after me, but another Bergman. And Bergman's rule says basically hot climates produce tall and thin body types and cold climates produce short and stout and strong body types. And as we can see, this is a good example. The uh, Watusis and other tribes in Africa who live in very hot climates we can see their body is tall and thin, which conforms to Bergman's rule. Okay, some history behind Neanderthals. They're found in Dusseldorf, Germany, in Neander Valley. Uh, T-A-L-S means, or T-A-L means valley. So Neander Valley, what that means in German. 
And the first one was found in 1856, just a few years before the book that changed the world by Charles Darwin was published. And so as soon as his book was published, they jumped on Neanderthals as missing, missing link and proof of evolution. And the early pictures, of course, he was constructed to look ape-like. And brain capacity now we know is about 200 cc's larger. Well, because their body type, their body was larger. So they had a larger brain because they had a stouter, stronger, more robust body. And the initial construction, of course, has now been shown to be not only wrong, but embarrassingly wrong. And other things we now know about them, since we've been doing much research, we found they use jewelry, which says something about them and about what they value. They use musical instruments. In fact, some of these we've discovered, you clean them up and they can produce really high quality music. And so they were not just a crude instrument, but they were instruments that were well designed to indeed produce beautiful music. They did K paintings, in fact, quite a few. They were capable of speech, so they could talk and they buried their dead. And so as a result of these discoveries, we realized that they were just like the guy next door. They had the same behavior traits and propensities and tendencies and likes and dislikes that we have today. Okay, Neanderthal burial cities. Most anthropologists recognize burial as a very human and very religious act. And the strongest evidence that they were Neanderthals were fully human and of our species is the four sites where Neanderthals and modern humans were buried, what? Buried together. And so this discovery was pretty much the end of Neanderthals as our evolutionary ancestors, which by the way, we're talking about over 100, 150 years. This was one of the best proofs there was of evolution. And well, this discovery showed it to be wrong, absolutely wrong. And not one, but four. And the sites were investigated very carefully and found indeed that modern Neanderthals and, oh, sorry, <laughs> Neanderthals, well, modern Neanderthals and modern humans were buried together because now we know they were modern uh, individuals just like all of us. And a good summary this far is that belief in evolution caused a distortion of the facts, but in the long run, science proved their stories were wrong. And I've often said this, evolution is going to be disproved and pretty much has been disproved, by the way, by science. And so science, just let it keep on working and it will indeed prove as it already done our worldview. And this is why I and so many others find science so incredibly supportive because it indeed shows empirically that my conclusions relative to creation and Genesis were right. And that is rewarding to be proven correct. Okay, a few Neanderthal traits. So there were many. Uh, of course, the superorbital torus is one example of a large brow ridge, a large nasal capacity. And of course, in a cold climate, that would be helpful. And the flat, long brain case. So there were a number of physical traits. The occipital bun is another example. But then again, among the different racial groups today, which I prefer to call people groups, by the way, there are a number of similar traits. Wouldn't it be boring if we all look pretty much the same? We all have the same facial features, the same voice, the same appearance. The joy of life is we have so many varieties in not only people, but in dogs and in so many animals. And indeed, these variations should be celebrated and not condemned. And here you can see a quick modern man compared to Neanderthal comparisons. And we can see there were many, but they were all minor traits. They were nothing major. And now we can see Neanderthal versus modern man when we do the comparison. And in this case, they use a Polynesian to make the comparison, I guess because these were the two most extreme differences found among human skulls. And so therefore they took the greatest differences and you can see them here. But of course, most of us are somewhere in between these two differences. 
the larger bell-like chest cavity of Neanderthals and wider pelvis that would produce a body which was strong, also very compact and dwarf-like in shape, and therefore an effective adaptation against the cold, which would be somewhat useful now for people today. So conclusions about them, they had protruding brow ridges, a very stocky build, short extremities. They were an isolated population, although they were pretty much throughout Europe, as well as uh, parts of Africa and parts of Asia. So they were, I guess, worldwide, they were somewhat isolated. They lived in a very cold and harsh climate, and they were also 100% human. And there we compare the two, and there you can see the differences are there, but not significant. And some modern ex examples, there are many. One of the most intriguing is a very famous evolutionist, William Hamilton, and he is said by his friends to have the general appearance of a Neanderthal. And he uh, kind of looks like it, but he is, unfortunately, he died fairly young, but uh, he was a good example of people today that have Neanderthal traits. And here is a picture taken by a friend of mine, a dentist in South Africa, and he had a patient that had very pronounced Neanderthal traits. And I asked him, could you get pictures of your patient? He said, sure, next time he comes in, I'll ask. And he asked and he got permission. And so here we go. A person with decided Neanderthal traits. And there we can see a profile. This was taken in his dental office. And this is a uh, Russian parliamentarian. And you can see he had very pronounced Neanderthal traits. And uh, he, uh, by the way, I'm not sure how you would judge him as being good looking or not so good looking, but the women must have judged him as good looking because there's another picture of him. He had a gorgeous wife and two gorgeous kids. And so I guess somebody must have judged him as good looking. And therefore, even though he had some Neanderthal traits, it did not detract from his appearance nor his love offerings. Now to go back in a, a few years ago, we can see a movie about Neanderthal man. And he was not only primitive, he was driven by mad desires. And you can see there he is uh, molesting some attractive women who are not exactly enamored by him. And this was quite a successful movie about 1953, I believe. But here we go, another picture of him. And there you can see the actor who played Neanderthal man in the movie. He looks what looks like the stereotypical picture of a Neanderthal man. And now even the evolutionists have labeled these people as our brethren. In fact, Michael Shermer, who is a active atheist, and he said these people in Scientific American is where he said this, are our Neanderthal brethren. And the growing, he's, this was back in, I say 1910, but that's, that's the wrong it's the wrong date. But anyways, the growing consensus is, he said, they're just another race of humans. And there we go, the cover of New Scientists. And they concluded, we're one species, not two. They're simply another species of us. And so now this is gone mainstream. And as I said at the beginning, there is really no doubt about their status. And I guess to seal this uh, conclusion in stone, the cover of National Geographic had a good article about, can you read that? The other humans. And indeed they stated we are just other humans as Neanderthals were all. But the most interesting was letters sent to the National Geographic and uh, they, one letter said, this is, the date's wrong, by the way, an interesting mistake here, February of, I think, 20, 2009 is what it was. But the artist did a fine job, this writer said, fleshing out a Neanderthal female, showing just what she looked like. She looked just like one of us. And this is indeed what is true. Another person wrote in, 
As a lifelong nudist, I've seen modern humans that are shaped exactly like that new Neanderthal woman in your issue. Apparently, Neanderthals are not extinct after all. They congregate at nudist resorts. And there we can see a good example. And now we can go flashback to a few years ago. This is in a National Geographic and Life magazine article, which basically modern man is at the highest part, then Cro-Magnon, and then guess what? Below Cro-Magnon is the Neanderthal man. Another example of how they were used fairly recently to prove evolution. And now, Christianity Today had an article, The Search for the Historical Adam, and basically they point out tragically that uh, many Christians accept human evolution in spite of the fact that science has shown it did not occur. And yet, some pastors are behind the times and still accept the idea of human evolution based on Neanderthal-looking individuals. And here's a couple more pictures from this 1965 book. And I use this because that's not that long ago. And we're beginning to realize that Neanderthals are our brethren. And yet the textbooks took a while to catch up. And you can see then Evolution of Man and His Tools in the larger picture. We can see the same uh, pictures. Neanderthals right towards the middle. And this is the worst, I think. This is a 1961 Life uh, magazine, Life, uh, I think it's from a Life book. But you can see anyways, the monkeys and our monkey ancestor and walking out of the picture is a Neanderthal. And so this was still featured in publications not that long ago. And there's a better picture you can see of our Neanderthal brother. And you can see right by him, the apes. And of course the picture, as they say, tells a thousand words. And that's the end of the presentation. So any questions or comments? Dr. Bergman, again, thank you so much for another great presentation. Uh, last time apes as ancestors, this time Neanderthals. And again, uh, more great feedback from the chat. Um, I've watched many lectures on, on Neanderthals, many as recent, uh, Dr. Bergman, as, as 2021, where these paleoanthropologists say things like Neanderthals are us, just built for an eco-glacial environment. They are not a separate species, they'll say, but the same species. And um, these are scientists on the evolutionist side admitting this now pretty well what biblical creationists have been admitting for years and years and predicting. My question to you, and a, a few variants of this came in from the chat. So what I can do is um, put it up on screen because although many paleoanthropologists are saying that Homo neanderthalensis is the same species, as us, there are some, um, even in, in the creation world, that have claimed humans can speciate and would actually place Neanderthal as a separate species. Is there any validity to the multiple species of human model, Jerry? No, because we now know that they did interbreed, as indicated by the burial of uh, modern man and Neanderthal man, they interbred. And now they've done with 23andMe and other of these companies that analyze our genetics, they found indeed that there are certain genes that are unique to Neanderthals. And guess what? I have some of those genes. And when I mention this to other people, I've had several people say, yeah, I've got some of those genes too. And so in fact, among my genetic past, I have German, of course, and Finnish and, and a few other uh, Jewish genes. But by and large, I've got a couple of Neanderthal genes, which now they use to type where someone came from and their national background. In fact, by the way, people sign up for 23 and Me and these other companies mostly to find out about their genetic past uh, ethnically. They want to find out, are my relatives from Europe or where are they from? And therefore, we've found that in my background, which of course makes sense because I'm my relatives are from the part of Europe that Neanderthals live, and so it doesn't surprise me that they found indeed a few genes in my body which are Neanderthal genes. Not a lot, but I think there was four or five percent they found were Neanderthal genes. And so therefore, uh, obviously they interbred when they do genetic analysis of people who spent their whole life in Australia or South America or other places. 
They don't find any of these Neanderthal genes. They find these Neanderthal genes in people who are primarily from Eastern Europe, which is where my relatives are from. And therefore, it makes sense that they would mix in with me and not mix in with Australians and other groups because they didn't, the Neanderthals did not live to a significant number in other parts of the world. And therefore, they are going to be found in people who were from Eastern Europe, as they were in my case. So there's no question that we can, by definition, if you can interbreed, you are seen as a single species. And that's this a common definition. It's not perfect, but on the other hand, uh, saying that they were a different species moves to me too far into racism, which I have a problem with. Amen. Well said. I completely agree. Uh, according to the biological definition of species, if, if you can interbreed, you're the same species. And we literally have, have their genes. So, uh, you know, by definition, we'd be the same species as them. And so the counter response I've, I've seen, even from uh, those in, in the creation world that would hold to uh, Neanderthals being a separate species, Dr. Bergman, is they'll say, well, the genetics are uh, dissimilar enough. They'll say Neanderthals are 99.7% the same as us rather than how we are all 99.99% similar. So they'll say that that very minute difference in genetics makes them a, a separate species. What would be a good response to, to, to that argument? Well, I think as 23andMe and these other companies are doing, when you look at people throughout the world, like the Australian Aborigines, my guess is you probably would find that there's maybe 0.3 difference between us and them as well. So if you think about a 0.3 difference is very, very small, considering the differences that you see among people. I mean, 99.3% similar is, is very, very similar genetically. And therefore, uh, it doesn't surprise me that. In fact, I would expect certain groups to have a greater difference. But as far as I know, they haven't done a lot of genetic testing among Australian Aborigines, so therefore, and among other groups, Polynesians, for example. And so therefore, we don't have enough uh, data. But my guess is in time, we will have enough data to make these comparisons. That's a good response. And I find it very interesting and uh, curious, Dr. Bergman, that um, a lot of technical papers have come out suggesting that Neanderthals were highly inbred. They suffered a, a, a high genetic load because they were uh, oftentimes isolated. And when you're isolated for long periods of time and, and you're inbreeding, a lot of these deleterious mutations come to the forefront and lead to rapid genetic degeneration. And there's one uh, technical article I, I like to cite that talks about how Neanderthals were 40% less fit than modern humans. And therefore, wouldn't that be a factor to, to, to consider in, in why they may be slightly different in terms of genetics from modern humans? Oh, yeah, clearly it would be a night that wouldn't be surprising in a cold climate. They couldn't travel too much traveling. And so they interbred a lot as, as we see the Amish have done. And therefore, that's caused a problem. So, yeah, I wouldn't doubt that there were a lot of accumulation of mutations back then, at least compared to the people around them who were able to travel around and uh, who had means of traveling in water. Of course, this is one efficient way of traveling. And therefore, you could travel to other places and uh, interbreed. By the way, now they estimate that in this country alone, about one out of every six marriages are interracial between white and black or white and Chinese and so on. And so therefore, we have a lot of interbreed in this country because you can do so. You can. You know, there's so many people from other countries that live here and uh, therefore interbreeding is more more common because of accessibility we tend to marry people that we live nearby or we go to school with that we go to work with and we have some relationship we can get to know people and so therefore uh as more and more of our racial barriers break down we have more and more blacks working with whites and so on and of course as you expect they're going to meet fall in love and marry and that's what we see happening Amen. Well said. So would you say, uh, Jerry, then that a lot of their uh, morphology could be explained by adaptation, environmental adaptation to the eco glacial environments that they existed in, while their genetics, at least the end stage uh, Neanderthal that we look at, could be explained due to uh, inbreeding, isolation, founder effects, and as you were pointing out, uh, accelerated mutation accumulation? Yeah, that, that would explain quite a bit of it, I would say. Okay. 
that's a great response. And in one, uh, another curious thing, and then I'll get on to the next question is you pointed out the environments that they lived in, right? It would be harsh, cold, dark, you know, they'd be, they'd certainly be lacking certain vitamins. Therefore, all it would take is, is a mutation in an important DNA repair enzyme to result in more and more mutations now accumulating generation after generation. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. That's so here is we got a lot of interesting questions here so i do want to thank the audience for being so engaged in in these important topics as they are some of my favorite topics as well so uh redefine living says there are some that claim uh noah could have been uh erectus or or the erectus type or variation um what, what are your thoughts on this have you heard of this jerry well i don't know how you conclude that i know as far as I know, he was a Semitic type, so he had traits of Semites. And so, although he was fairly close to the original creation, mutation-wise, so therefore, he, he was very healthy. So, of course, again, Homo erectus is a label. And uh, even creationists disagree whether or not it's skeleton. They say it's Homo erectus was Homo erectus or modern man and so on. So, we get into a lot of distinctions which really can't be made with a lot of certainty. And that uh, bothers me when we start to look at this minutia, which is not uh, very, very difficult to make different claims. We have so many people today that are really quite different, but yet they're, we know, part of our group and part of our race and part of our, you know, you can intermarry with them and so on. So uh, I think we've focused too much on external traits. When I taught at the medical school, people are always surprised that uh, when you did heart transplants and organ transplants and so on, it didn't matter the race of the person. And they think, oh, you mean you can take a, an organ from a, a black and, and and put it into a white? That's not what they're concerned about. They're concerned about uh, immuno, immunological compatibility. And that does not relate much to race. And so therefore, they did not really bother looking at race. In fact, if you ask what race this organ came from, this kidney came from, they don't know. They don't care. They're just concerned about whether or not it's histologically compatible. And so, therefore, it wasn't an issue. So we, we tend to judge too heavily on external traits and not physical traits that are more relevant. Amen. I, I, I completely agree. And I like to say um, in determining ancestry, answering the question of ancestry, it's, it's in our genetics. It's, it's in our DNA. That would be the best way to answer that question. And that's why when we look to the genetics of Neanderthal, we see that we've interbred with them. So at that point, that should be enough to conclude that that we're the same species. I would say if we had the DNA of Erectus, it would uh, probably tell us uh, some of the same things. And from my study into Erectus, they seem to have been uh, subject. And as you pointed out, it's more so just a label. So a lot of the, sp the specimens that we've seen um, seem to be the result of reductive evolution. And that's why we see a, a lot of their uh, features like the smaller brain and just a lot of the anomalies that, that have been manifested in them. I know that's a conclusion made in, in the book Contested Bones as well. So for me, it would be then hard to say that Noah would have been Erectus because you pointed out, uh, Dr. Bergman, correct me if I'm wrong, Noah would have been closer to the flood and therefore healthier and probably not subject to reductive evolution. Right. That's true. And a major problem we have in looking at all these fossils is that boy, what we have is lots of fragments. And uh, I think Mark Twain said it best. The fossil record is a few small pieces of bone and a few buckets of plaster pairs. <laughs> and that many, that's what Mark Twain said. And he wasn't exactly, you know, a, a Christian, active Christian. So uh, he said, I think quite accurately indeed, that we're taking some bone parts and trying to put them together and indeed that has a lot to do with your perception of what the miss what the end result should look like and therefore we have to be very careful well said that's such a great point that i want the audience to uh consider and and kind of absorb because bones bones found in the dirt for one you're pointing out the fossil record is highly fragmented and low quality and bones can be deceiving because even today, Dr. Bergman, we know there oftentimes exists more morphological variation within the same species than across species. But we know various species, like if we look at, at the different uh, canid species, we know they interbreed. 
But right. a fossil, how, how are we supposed to be able to tell <laughs> what may be the result of, let's say, homology or convergent evolution in a fossil? We don't have their genetics. We can't do breeding tests. And the dog is a good example. If you compare the fossils of dogs, and I've seen pictures that do this, you would say these are clearly different species. They cannot be the same species. Well, we know they are because we know that they're dogs, like a pug, for example, and a German shepherd and uh, a dog that has a bulldog, for example. We see very, very different bone shapes. And as a result, we would conclude if we just had the fossil, we would include, conclude that these were just different uh, animals. But we don't. You know, in this case, we have the dog and we can obtain the fossils and we know, therefore, that they were the same species. Amen. Well said. Well said, uh, Dr. Bergman. So here's another question that comes in. <clears throat> We've got a ton of questions here. So this one comes in from Cool Jesus. And he asks, um, can you ask Jerry if he agrees with um, some of the conclusions, I, I guess, made by, by some barominologists that assign homo naledi specifically? I'm not sure if you have a, an opinion on this, Jerry, that um, place naledi as, as a human in, in the human baromen. I know there's a lot of controversial in his study he did, did a baromenology comparison, and there's a lot of controversy. And uh, I have problems with, I guess, putting him with the human kind. But on the other hand, uh, I try to look at the whole broad picture and try to look at the trends that we see and not, you know, one individual. Uh, again, I'm somewhat skeptical since I've spent a lot of time with my book as Apes as Ancestors spent a lot of time looking at the fossil record and I find again we've got so many fragments they're often distorted because of pressure they're often as a result of a heating and cooling changes and so on and therefore it's hard to get the right parts and assemble them properly to determine indeed what this is like so uh, and I guess I have to admit I'm somewhat skeptical of terminology because what we do is take certain traits and make comparisons on those traits but if I took a different set of traits, I may come up with a different conclusion. And so therefore, I've always been kind of, I mean, it's, it's helpful and useful on the other hand, but I've noticed a lot of baromenology research doesn't, to me, further our understanding of the animal differences very much at all. So it's, uh, it I, depends on what traits you select. I agree with that 100%. That's a, a fantastic answer. It's, it's similar to what the evolutionists do in their family trees and in phylogenetic systematics where there's there's something I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, Jerry, incomplete lineage sorting. While um, depending on what gene you're looking at, you can look at one gene and, and build a family tree across a variety of different species and, and you'll get one hierarchy. But then if you look at a different gene, you, you get an entirely different family tree. So it's very selective, I, I've yeah. noticed. Yeah, it is. So, so here, here's a question that's kind of uh, a question that has to do with the bigger picture of what we're looking at in terms of fossils. And I know you've touched on this here in this book that I highly recommend, Fossil Forensics. Big book, tons of great information. So I want to encourage people to check that out. And um, the question is, Dr. Bergman, how do we best explain the ordering of the fossil record? Evolutionists will look to the ordering as a progression from simpler organisms to more complex organisms, right? Marine creatures at the bottom, up to reptiles, mammals, and then eventually man in the series of, I guess, macroevolution. From, from a creationist starting point, how, how would we best explain that? Well, I know you won't find the, the proper fossil ordering in any one place on the earth. In order to get that, you have to look at many different fossil positions and then you put it together, number one. Number two, my main problem is, is that I've spent not a lot of time fossil hunting, but it's amazing how many, when you dig for fossils, there's you don't find much evidence of that ordering in most places. You find, first of all, about 80% of all the organisms you find are, are marine type, and uh, you find just even the more advanced, so-called more advanced organisms, you don't find those necessarily really, really deep. A lot of these they found, they find them fairly close to the surface. Like organisms, uh, human uh, fossils, they find that most of them that I'm familiar with when I talk about where they found them at, most of them stick up out of the ground. And they, of course, notice, see, that looks like a fossil. And they dig a few inches underneath and they find it is a fossil. And so then they start this looking in this area to find evidence of the rest of the fossil 
And so I'm not aware of any case where they've dug 40, 50 feet down and found human fossils or pre-human fossils. I'm aware only of where they found basically fossils near the surface. Now, of course, they claim they were 30 feet down and then erosion produced the situation to where they're near the surface. On the other hand, I'm skeptical of where fossils are found if you can determine much at all about where they are in the fossil record by simply where they're found. I know that's commonly done, but I know a problem is they determine the age of the rocks by the fossils. They determine the fossil age by the rocks they're found in. So I know they, they criticize that as a claim that's false. But on the other hand, in many cases, when I've looked at the details, this is all too often what you find. And so I'm not really impressed with uh, with this fossil order in the fossil uh, staircase. But they're That's found in every geology book, so they're very commonly found, but I think it's a distortion of reality when you line them all up nice and neat so you get the primitive organism at the bottom and the most advanced at the top. And all too often, most of the time, you don't find that neat ordering. Well, so that's such an important point because the way that they represent it is actually uh, inconsistent with, with the way that it's actually found in, in the so-called geologic uh, column. And even when you were to do, if you were to just shift away from bones found in the dirt a little bit to genetics, and we've discussed, uh, Jerry, in, in the previous program and a bit here today, that uh, deleterious mutation accumulation is, is a real thing. So when you look to the fossil record and you see these living fossils like the coelacanth, the horseshoe crab that are in supposedly hundreds of millions of years worth of, of strata. Well, based on what we know today, that uh, mutation accumulation puts shelf lives on genomes. How could these living fossils have survived for hundreds of millions of years? Yeah, that's true. Here's a good question. And, and of course, uh, being a discussion here, the answer would be limited. So again, I do want to recommend your book, Fossil Forensics. Uh, but the question is, Jerry, in your book, Fossil Forensics, you discuss whale evolution. What are your thoughts on the claims of a whale vestigial pelvis? And I will say, Jerry, I, I host a lot of creation evolution debates here, and the evolutionists in 2022 are still using this in, in almost every debate. Um, and, and they'll say that, you know, this, this so-called leftover um, pelvis is evidence of, of walking whales in the past. What's a good way to rebut that? Yeah, from my reading, it's pretty clear that it's pretty hard to copulate in the water when you're weighing 2,000, 5,000 pounds. And so therefore, from my reading, it's, I thought it was pretty well agreed that these facilitated copulation of whales in the water. And so they, from what I, same with snakes, they facilitate copulation. And so therefore, I'm, I guess I, it's a stretch to me to claim that these were the remnants or the beginning of legs developing. Usually they claim the remnants, of course, of legs. And uh, legs are pretty handy to get around. And I'll tell you, to lose legs, they really had a hard time explaining why an organism would lose legs since they are really very important in getting around. And so the idea that we were four-legged mammals and then ended up evolving into whales, I think is probably one of the most I hate to say ludicrous, but it's probably one of the most foolish ideas they've ever come up with. I went to a conference once and the question was asked, what is the best evidence for evolution? And the paleontologist there brought up the evolution of whales. And I thought, oh no, this is just really problematic. There must be a much better example than that. And that's what he talked about. And as he talked about the fossil evolution from um, primitive four-legged walking mammal to whales, I thought, boy, this is just nitpicking, just selecting examples out of nowhere that didn't seem to belong together. And you, they try to put them in a, a path from, from mammals, four-legged quadrupeds to whales, really is a stretch. And uh, I wasn't too impressed with that as being very useful proof, but... Uh, but anyways, it's from what, and I'm, as far as I know, this is not disputed that these are facilitate copulation of the whales. And that's true with snakes. It's true with uh, whales as well. So I'm not aware of any study that contradicts that. So I guess if the person had a reference they could give me, then I could look, look it up and, and, uh, and see what they had to say. 
as with a lot of their claims in terms of these evolutionary leftovers, these vestigial organs, we find that they're not actually the ancient remnants of, of past evolutionary structures that have either devolved, altered their function, um, you know, the various claims that they'll make. These uh, structures actually are functional components to the respective organisms, as, as you're pointing out. They are these so-called vestigial legs are necessary. They connect to some very important muscles that assist in uh, reproduction and, and copulation, as, as you're pointing out. Um, so then what is your thoughts overall, uh, Jerry, on, on the, the series that they like to present in textbooks where you've got, you know, Pachycetus, Ambulocetus, Basilosaurus, eventually up to uh, modern whales. What are your thoughts on that, that series that they like to represent? And I've done a whole book on this. It's not published yet, but it's pretty clear to me. You're just talking about different animals. You do a lot of digging, a lot of research. You find animals, you line them up and you get progression from uh, a tetrapod to whales. And uh, there are so many differences, which indicate that they're not, you're not looking at progression. You're simply looking at different animal, different traits, different lifestyle. And so I can't, I think it's really stressed to try to line these up and make any inferences from these. All of them, the trail to me looked like they survived quite well as they were. And so I'm not sure how you can say, well, these were less effective and therefore they evolved other traits and therefore they eventually became whales as a result of improving their survivability. So I just don't see that at all. And, and maybe I should go into more detail that in my book, but you yeah you end up with 400 page book and people don't they say <laughs> every time you add another chapter to a book you you, re, you reduce the sales by 10 percent <laughs> <laughs> so that's true i i've got a couple of books on uh, racism and evolution and i have to admit i haven't even opened the book up because they're like 900 pages and i thought <laughs> i don't know if i can read i mean it's it's really it's a doorstop book and i don't know if i can read 900 pages i mean no but Evolution was racist, but 900 pages, I don't think I can read that. And then the same author, by the way, realized that it wasn't selling many books. So he's got the abbreviated version, which is only 150 pages. And I bought the 150 page book and I may, may be inclined to read that because I'll read a 150 page book, but I'm not going to read a 900. I mean, it's, <laughs> I, it's like a phone book, a thick phone book. Right. And I don't know how you could say that much about racism and evolution, but I guess the guy did. And so... Uh, <laughs> That's a problem. Yeah, I just wish there was more time in the day to get through all of the uh, many books that I and I'm sure you want to uh, get through. And in writing books, as you've pointed out, sometimes it's difficult to know when to end because <laughs> there really is uh, endless information out there. Um, so here's another question again, you know, a question that you've responded to thoroughly and comprehensively in, in your many books specifically here, fossil uh, forensics that I have next to me. How do we uh, debunk or address the argument that says or insists modern birds evolved from theropod-like dinosaurs? And as a matter of fact, taxonomists would actually say modern birds are living dinosaurs. I know that's a claim that's often made and I haven't looked thoroughly into that issue, but I have looked at a few things. Like for example, a bird heart is very much like a mammal heart. In fact, if I, if I remember right, it's a four-chambered heart like our heart is, whereas a reptile heart is very different. I think it's a two, three-chambered heart, but the heart is designed very differently, and therefore that's one of many different organ structures which gives a contrast between reptiles and birds and makes them closer to mammals. Another one, of course, of course, is the lung, the lung system, which is very different from that of uh, uh, rep, of uh, fossil of uh, dinosaurs. The problem is, is when you're trying to figure out where birds evolved from, what choices do you have? And they select the best choice available, which is to me a very poor choice. They're not going to say, "Well, I guess well, we have no idea where they evolved from. We we have no even clues." But to me, it's, it's pathetic when they have to choose birds evolved from dinosaurs especially when you consider the biological differences are enormous. Again, birds are far more like us mammals than they are like dinosaurs. And therefore, yeah, you get some morphological similarities, of course, the bird feet, and you have dinosaurs that have very bird-like feet. So there are some similarities. But aside from those, the 
anatomy and the physiology is just world apart, world, world apart difference. And so I think they're better off saying we have no idea where birds evolve from. But I guess when someone asks you a question, you try to answer it and they say, well, where did birds evolve from? Well, I, I got dinosaurs. You have an answer, but to me, they're really stretching it to come up with a birds evolved from dinosaurs. There's just morphologically and and that anatomically, there's just huge differences. In fact, in many ways, birds are unique, not only from reptiles, dinosaurs, but also from mammals as well. So indeed, they're designed in many, many, many ways very, very differently. So, Thank you, uh, Jerry, for the response. So I'm, I'm assuming you wouldn't uh, hold to the position that says uh, theropod dinosaurs had feathers, feathered dinosaurs. I'm not very impressed so far with the uh, findings so, so far. And uh, there are a number of evolutionary paleontologists who are not impressed either. And uh, they think what looked like feather, feathers were not feathers, but they were certain indentations as a result of certain structures in the dermis of the reptile. And so it's, uh, I'm not very impressed. And I think if that was the case, uh, you would have much more evidence. Also, what would, what would be the function of feathers on dinosaurs? I know they say, well, they're thermal, help them stay warm. That's true. There's some arguments you can make for feathers, but on the other hand, a feather is a very unique very differently designed structure. It's very, very different from scales, of course, very, very different from skin. And so therefore to explain where feathers evolve from is a problem and it's you're not getting very far in arguing dinosaurs had feathers. But of course, you know, you have a lot of strange life around. It's certainly possible that some dinosaurs could have had feathers, but that doesn't prove they're evolving into birds. Right. You, proves they have, you know, they're strange creatures that have feathers like an ostrich. I mean, they, they don't seem to belong, and but they're very useful on that bird. But on the other hand, it's uh, it, to some degree, it wouldn't bother me if they were fur instead of feathers. It would just, to me, look like the same animal. And I can't see the advantage of having feathers, but I guess for appearance sake and for variety. It said that one thing you learn about God by studying nature is God loves variety. And that's, these are one of many, many examples which show that. That's a good response, uh, Dr. Bergman, especially considering today what we see in terms of biodiversity is just a snapshot into the overall biodiversity that's existed on the planet. So we have some interesting creatures today like the platypus and we've had some interesting creatures in, in the past. And, and like you, um, we're kind of pointing out is, is there are some, even in the evolutionist camp, this is a more recent book, I believe from 2020 that I bought from uh, Alan Fiducia. He's no um, supporter of young earth creation. And, and even he would, would challenge this idea of, of feathered dinosaurs. Um, so here's the, the next question that comes in here. This comes in from gangster ghost. And um, he asks, I have a question about, evo about evolution. Is, is it true what they say that we have genes from other animals? That's what Aaron Ra says. Um, I, I think if I were to interpret this question, maybe he's looking to just like the similar genetic sequences that we find in uh, the, bi the biological world, um, homologous sequences that evolutionists would say we've inherited from from common ancestors. So do similar genes represent evolutionary well, history, yeah, Jerry? There's a lot of similar genes talking about the heart. So many organisms have a four-chambered heart, and I would assume that they would have many genes that produce a four-chambered heart. They have the valve that are necessary. They have the, the uh, center... The, the, the system which allows them to heart to beat properly, the pacemaker, and the uh, and all the other structures. So yeah, there's a lot of genes. In fact, they found a lot of genes even in um, worms that are similar to those found in humans. So uh, it doesn't surprise me because all life has to have certain things to live. It all has to have some system to pump blood around the body, and uh, all. Animals with a certain size, of course, require some type of heart pumping system. And so therefore, you're going to have a lot of genetic similarity. And chemically, there's so many, of course, similarities between uh, uh, all animals that you're going to find so many of the genes. Biochemically, there's so many similarities. The genetics is so similar. So I would expect there's a lot of similarities between 
the genes of all animals that have genes. And that doesn't surprise me that you find similarities. I would expect to find more. And uh, even among uh, bacteria, you've got so many uh, genes that are common to bacteria are common to us as well because they have uh, the similar genetic system. They have to be able to convert uh, RNA into protein. And so therefore they have very similar systems that, that do, do that. So, and that's why you can take a gene from a human and splice it into a bacteria and it does the work of producing this stuff that humans can produce. So, so there are so many, many similarities all life must have in order to live. And so that doesn't surprise me at all. Not the least. That's a great response. Great point um, there, Jerry. I, I appreciate that response to obviously a common evolutionary argument that, that I know you're you're familiar with. And one thing I want to add too is I find it interesting that even in the similar genetic sequences that we find, let's say, between humans and chimpanzees, we find uh, vast differences in terms of the way these genes are expressed or even in terms of you know epigenetics. So even in the similar sequences, there's still differences, which I think is a challenge for uh, evolutionary theory. So uh, it, it's always such a good time talking to you, uh, Jerry. You are an encyclopedia worth of information. I just noticed we're over the hour mark, so time's flying by with you. I'm gonna start winding it down here. I wanna respect your time. And uh, I'm gonna get the last couple questions here that at least do uh, have to do with uh, Neanderthal specifically, as that's the main topic. And then we'll kind of wrap it up here. Uh, Jerry. So this one comes in from uh, Cool Jesus, and he apologizes if he may have uh, missed it. Um, but he, he wanted to ask you, just to clarify, can you ask Jerry when he believes Neanderthals existed after the flood? Oh, I think they probably did. I think they existed after the flood, yeah. And I think that uh, the body's somewhat malleable. It's limited, of course, but it's amazing how well we can adapt to various climates and various differences in the environment. And I think the Neanderthals simply adapted to the environment. And as a result, they have certain body traits, which were common in that part of the world. And therefore, I think that uh, and from what we found in the fossil record and in caves and so on, it's pretty clear that they existed after the flood. And therefore, they it would assume if they did not exist after the flood, that the caves and so on, which were often their home, would have been destroyed during the flood. And therefore, it might my guess is it's likely that they lived after the flood. In fact, some people think the Neanderthals lived as a separate group until uh, 1,500, 2,000 years ago. And so therefore, they probably existed for quite a while. And I think by and large, they interbred. And they were bred out, out of existence. And that's called uh, genocide by intermarriage. And that's what's concerns about the Jews in Israel. They're concerned about intermarriage is going to cause genocide of the Jews. And therefore, they're trying to encourage, at least in Israel, marriage among other Jews so that the Jews don't become extinct as a result of intermarriage, which, of course, is happening now. You find, as I mentioned, one out of six marriages are interracial in this country. And if that keeps up, guess what's going to happen? You're not going to have many white, white guys walking around, many black, black guys walking around. There'll be eventually assuming this intermarriage continues, eventually a high percent of the population will have brown eyes, brown hair, brown skin, and that's the result of intermarriage. And so we can literally have genocide through intermarriage. And that's, by the way, why some in the past discouraged intermarriage because they realized that that would be genocide and God created the different races for a reason and genocide by intermarriage they felt would be wrong. Of course, with society's changes, that's no longer accepted, but by and large, that's true though. And you see, when I look at my students and so on, I find so many are obviously a product of interracial marriage and they're typically brown skin, brown eyes, and brown hair. They lose all these unique traits and that's of course the result of intermarriage. And uh, although that's gonna take a while before a group becomes extinct, but if you notice on TV especially, you'll notice so many of the blacks really look more like Mexicans or Hispanic or some other group because of intermarriage, which is fine. I mean, that's, in fact, the early church, the early fathers of America, Jefferson and so on, realized that that is how we eliminate racism is intermarriage. And they, in Washington and Jefferson's day, they actually encouraged intermarriage and tried to develop systems which would encourage intermarriage. Like if you had married a person of a different race, you got $500 or something. 
and uh, that's limited. And of course, time went beyond that. And that wasn't implemented to a high degree. But on the other hand, uh, there were quite a few mixed race people that owned slaves. And so they were technically blacks and they owned slaves. There's a whole book about this, which I haven't read yet, but it's on my list of books to read. And as they found most of these were blacks who had slaves were as a result of an intermarriage between a white and a black. And also the whites and the Indians intermarried quite a bit, quite a bit, as well as the Indians and the African, African Americans intermarried quite a bit. And so you have a mixture of different groups. So uh, I would say probably the Neanderthals just intermarried. And that's why so many of us have Neanderthal traits because of intermarriage. <laughs> Appreciate it, Jerry. And I, I guess one question I would have when it comes to the Neanderthal DNA and, and how we know that we actually uh, interbred with them, we have their genetics um, and there's specific uh, genetic markers we, we can look to. Why do you think it is that, that we can get uh, DNA from Neanderthal specimens, but not um, other, you know, so-called hominids like Arachdis or Hobbit or Nilot, at least not yet. Um, why do you think that is, Jerry? Well, one problem is I think the Neanderthals were around for a lot longer period than some of these others were. And we have so many, and I've always been somewhat skeptical, but it seems like they've done a good job sequencing Neanderthal genes, especially mitochondria. But still, I have some question whether or not you have a, uh, a skeleton which is 2,000 years old, whether or not the DNA has been preserved that well. I know in teaching forensics, I taught forensics for a number of years, and we have people we know died in 40, 1947, and yet in court they can argue that you cannot base any comparisons on someone that died in 1947 because the DNA through cosmic radiation and so on is going to be deteriorated to the point where you can't make comparisons. And so if you have a hard time making comparisons for a person that died 50, 100 years ago, how can you make comparisons of Neanderthals who they claim died off 50,000 years ago? So, of course, my guess is they didn't die off that long ago. But on the other hand, I've always had a hard time accepting the, the findings because of concerns about contamination and so on. I know they, they claim they really try to look at this. They use clean labs level five in order to do the research, make sure there wasn't contamination. And they worked really, really hard to try to get the accurate uh, DNA codons. And they, they seem to have succeeded, but in my mind, there's some question whether or not they were able to succeed as well as they uh, think they have. So that's okay. my answer. <laughs> well, I appreciate the answer. Okay, we're going to wind it down with this last question. I will say there's been a lot of questions that come in. You're a fan favorite here, uh, Dr. Bergman, and to the audience, thank you for being so engaged with this topic and asking so many good questions. So here's here's the final question before we wrap it up. I do want to encourage those in the audience, share this around. It's an important topic. So uh, the question, Dr. Bergman, is evolutionists look to African genetic diversity to... Uh, argue that humans are older than than four to six thousand years. They'll say this is why you know humans came out of Africa rather than Babel. Is at least one of their arguments is genetic diversity, and uh, generally the diversity in Africa is higher than non-Africans. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this, and what would be a good good response to uh, proponents of out of Africa? It's intriguing in that the problem has not been what they claim it is here, the problem has been the opposite. Why are humans so similar? Why are we 99.9% .9 similar? And so to get that similarity, if we're indeed, you know, if we've evolved out of Africa six to 10,000 or whatever, uh, I guess much long, 50 to 100,000 years ago, the dates depends upon who you ask, but on the other hand, so therefore they postulate a bottleneck is what caused the similarity. So we had lots of different apes in the breeding and so on. And we had a bottleneck where there's only a few dozen left or a few hundred maybe left. There's a small number left. And so therefore we descended from that small number. And so they have the, in fact, the opposite problem. Why are we so similar? And the bottleneck is an explanation. So when they try to go back to these way, you know, 50, 100,000 years or so ago, that's a problem for the similarity, it's not a problem for us, it's a problem for them. And they've evolutionists have solved that, of course, by the bottleneck explanation. But uh, I know people argue that and they say, well, 
at least there must have been 50 to 60 different persons, different uh, primates that survived that bottleneck and we evolved from them. But on the other hand, that's uh, problematic in many ways because still, again, 99.9% .9 similar is just as so few differences between humans. Too small to have evolved from creatures that live many, many thousands of years ago. And so that's a problem they have. And of course, that's the idea behind the historic Adam and the historic Eve, that there are too many similarities. So therefore, they trace this back to a small number of people. So they've supported our position, not their position. You know, Dr. Bergman, that answer is, is so great that to me, that's a really fatal blow to, well, out of Africa and deep time evolution, because if we've been evolving Australopithecines to Habilis to Erectus to, you know, modern humans for millions of years, accumulating mutations and mutations are adding genetic diversity, why do we have such low diversity? And you pointed out that they invented a post hoc. Uh, rescue device uh, and out of Africa population bottleneck. But correct me if I'm wrong, in order to reduce those those levels of genetic diversity to roughly what we have today, wouldn't they need a uh, multi-generational bottleneck? Like, wouldn't it have to be thousands of years of just inbreeding and uh, degeneration due to the inbreeding? Yeah, or several bottlenecks. That's another theory. So that we had two or three historic bottlenecks and got the population down to a couple hundred thousand and later on it got it down to several hundred and later on it got it down to 50 or 60 families. So that's why we have so many similarity, but there's a lot of speculation and I guess I have a hard time with speculating. We need to, the area I look at, there's not much speculation going on, just the facts. Mm -hmm. it's, it's primarily what I'm doing now is comparing the, uh, the theories of the evolution of organs, the evolution of the heart, of the liver, of the lungs, of bone, of the brain, of eyes, and so on. And I'm finding in doing that, they just, none of these systems, because they can they really explain the evolution of the organ. The first lung was a lung, functioned as a lung. We have no viable explanation as where the lung could evolve from. The first heart was a heart. The first uh, liver was a liver. The first Kidney was a kidney. The first bladder was a bladder. The first, you name it, the first tongue was the tongue. And so I just did an article recently on the tongue evolution. And therefore, uh, over and over, you see that they just can't explain where these came from. And the literature is very clear. You can't even imagine what a pre-kidney would look like. I mean, you can get some theories of what it would look like. But on the other hand, we a kidney has a very specific function. And it's very hard to get a system that works as well as a kidney that would substitute for a kidney that is not a kidney. I mean, you certainly have filtration system, but these are in animals that don't have hearts. They have basically insert circulation within the entire uh, cell and therefore it doesn't really support their worldview. So eventually I'll do every organ and eventually I'll hopefully produce another book which covers the evolution of all organs showing there's no evidence for any of them. That's well, those are the f go ahead yeah those are the facts that is uh, that which is empirical I, I love the work that you're doing and I, I guess I'll sneak this in here because dr. Bergman you recently uh, published a technical paper uh, in, in the answers research journal titled the problem of over design in Darwinism um, that, that that's a very interesting uh, topic and, and title can you kind of touch on this a, a little bit maybe just for the audience and, and provide a little bit of details for people to check that out yeah, evolution basically says that we have evolved what we have evolved because it helps in our survival. And survivability is important in what we evolved. It's selected because we've evolved organs that help us give a slight edge compared to others that don't have that. Well, there's so many traits that people have that are just mind boggling and we can't imagine a survival reason for them. And uh, many examples, like I think I talk about the, the memorizers, people who can literally memorize a number of five, six, ten in the world that they know of that can remember every day of their life. And so you say, okay, June 3rd, 1978, what were you doing? Oh, that would be a Thursday. And uh, what was I doing? Well, I just had a party at that time. And oh, yes, I had a, and they can describe in detail what happened on that day. And so we're talking about people who have a memory of virtually almost every day of their life. 
and can recount in details uh, what happened. The calendar calculators is another simpler and more common. If you say December 12th, what day would that be? Or December 12th, 1902. Well, that would be a Tuesday. And uh, then they can tell you some details about the day, these calendar calculators. And another more interesting example is the acrobatic people who can just do tricks, can flip three times over and land on their feet and do it accurately. And you wonder why in the world would that be helpful for us in survival? And the concern is, is that none of us can do that. Hardly a few people can do that. And so therefore, how can those few people achieve these incredible feats where the vast majority can't? And you can't imagine a beneficial uh, use of that ability. I mean, when you're yeah, jumping off trees and so on, I guess to land on your feet would be useful. So on the other hand, to develop these skills would just not seem to be uh, survival helpful. And another example is piloting a plane. Here, these people can travel at three, four, five, six hundred miles per hour and accurately get a plane up in the air and fly a plane and get it down. And yet, how would we evolve that skill to be able to do that? And yet, pe people can be trained to do that. And people can be trained to do all kinds of incredibly feats. And why would they have these abilities when indeed there's just, you know, it's not survival factor. Music is another one. How does music help us survive? Why do some people develop incredible talents playing musical instruments and music? Now, evolutionists try to explain that away. They basically say that, well, we've evolved the ability to sing because that attracts mates and therefore we're more apt to reproduce and therefore we're more apt to uh, pass on those genes to our offspring. Well, that sounds plausible, but on the other hand, 99% of us don't have exceptional musical talents and we reproduce without a problem. And so therefore, uh, that's if my guess is not many women, that's not a major factor in selecting a mate that may help, especially if they have an interest in music, but that's not going to be something most women uh, focus on. And so the social reinforcement claim, I think it's vacuous. And therefore, uh, we, we have those talents. And some people have incredible talent, ability to play nine instruments. And you put them on a piano and they can just play, play, play. And I think I mentioned in my article, a couple of examples of four five, six year olds who play Beethoven and can not only play it, but they can, can uh, create new music and create on the piano. And so what advantage would that have to survivability? They're, they're five years old and they can play Beethoven before 2000 people and do it really, really well. And so therefore the only way they've been able to explain that is, well, it helps you attract mates, but five-year-olds are not interested in attracting mates. And therefore, uh, and we know there are genes that are involved in that because music is in, in families, partially because if, if I'm a musician, I'm going to encourage my children to be musicians as well. But on the other hand, we know genes are part of the ability to be able to play the piano and music, any musical instrument as well as other things. And so uh, that's what I cover. I've always been interested in that. I've collected hundreds of books about uh, people who have phenomenal abilities and they're just, just discovered when they're really young. And they have people who graduate from college with a degree in medicine when they're seven or nine or 12. And so therefore, how can these people do that? Well, that's what I've had an interest in doing. And there are quite a few people that have done really well academically when they're quite young. And they get their PhD when they're 14. And so uh, how do they have these skills to... to to, to do mathematics and et cetera. Right. Now, that's what I cover in the article. That's article, by the way, is a summary of a book I wrote. And I basically, the publisher said, you got to cut it down to 20 pages. And I think it got it down to 15 or 16. I had a lot of idiot savants in there and I just took all those out. That's another, another uh, article. So that's what I found. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Bergman, I've got for the audience, I've got the uh, article or the um, technical article here in Answers Research Journal for people to check out. I appreciate that response. As I always say, you know, it's 2022. It's a great time to be a biblical creationist. The evidence really is overwhelmingly on our side. And as you've uh, demonstrated now for a second time here, Jerry, uh, it, it is not on the side of, of the evolution 
story, a lot, a lot of fanciful storytelling. So again, Jerry, I really want to uh, thank one, you for the, yep, go one ahead. One quick thing. I submitted that to one journal, they turned it down. And they said, the reason was you don't offer any evolutionary explanation for how these abilities developed. And so I looked and looked and looked and I couldn't find any viable evolutionary explanation except <laughs> it helps you find the mates. It's the only thing I found. They really have no idea how indeed we could evolve these phenomenal abilities. And so in the second, fortunately, the second article, the second journal I sent it to, they didn't demand that particular concern. And so therefore I didn't, they accepted it. And they published it without having me to look again for, you know, there just is no <laughs> argument out there for evolutionists to claim that. They admit, yeah, these are phenomenal. And if we don't understand how they develop, but they must have through evolution, and that's all we can say. And so that was the end of the, the claims. I'm really glad you pointed that out because, you know, I've spent a lot of time reading these technical papers as well as, as it pertains to a lot of the essential functional roles in, in terms of the uh, physiology and just healthy life processes in the cell in, in what evolution look to as like junk sequences. And I, I find it kind of humorous because when you get to like the discussion portion of these papers or the conclusions, as you pointed out, they don't give any, any viable empirical reasons why we should believe these, these functional roles, as you're pointing out, the, the, these organs, the, these skills, these talents have evolved naturalistically. It's just a lot of, a lot of times they'll say things like, you know, engines of evolution or, uh, you know, selective pressures, <laughs> mating. These aren't answers, you know, the evolutionists are providing. That's so, true. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> so I, again, I appreciate all the work you're doing, uh, Jerry. I, I highly recommend your articles, your books. You're very uh, comprehensive, knowledgeable, and um, yeah. A really new one just came out, The Three Pillars of Evolution Demolished. And what I do is take the three pillars, and if any one of them are demolished, evolution falls. And I demolish from the literature, scientific literature, I demolished all three of them. And the three pillars are mutations, abiogenesis, and natural selection. And I show all of those fail in supporting evolution. So the pillars are gone, and therefore evolution falls. And my next book, which just came out actually yesterday, is called The Three last the last pillars of darwinian evolution falsified and i take all the other pillars this is from amazon i don't have a copy of the book yet this is from amazon and i point out all the other pillars they use like homology have also been demolished and so evolution doesn't have a leg to stand on literally well i love it i love it that's awesome uh, nice looking books there, uh, Jerry. I, I love the work you do. And it looks like I will be uh, personally placing a, another order uh, for those books. And again, to the live audience, please uh, check out the relevant links in the description box so you can uh, get yourself a copy as well. Uh, Again, Jerry, it, it's a privilege. It, it's an honor. Thank you so much. Uh, time flies by. It's been an hour and a half, so I do appreciate your time. Any any final words, final thoughts from you uh, before we close down the show? Just as I do more and more research in this area, it really is embarrassing that people could actually believe that we evolved from apes, that evolution is true. It's embarrassing. You wonder how in the world they could accept something that is so overwhelmingly false. And I guess I find it very rewarding to do this research because a, a, over and over and over again, I find the peer-reviewed literature supports my position and that's rewarding. It's kind of like I'm looking for gems and I find them. They're all. <laughs> and so I find that very rewarding to do. And I come up with one idea after another and I can anticipate what I'm going to find. I may be surprised someday, but so far I haven't. I find it supports the creation worldview and it's just very rewarding to do so. It's nice to start a building and it works, build it up and it looks good and you're done and you know you can build it up and you know it's going to look good when you're done. So therefore I find it very rewarding to do this work. So my wife wonders why I spend so much time proving something which is so obviously true. Well, <laughs> it's, it's just, why not? It's just, uh, I got the house done and now I want to build a porch and let's see what the porch <laughs> looks like. And so I just keep on working and uh, I'm doing now the effective evolution on Holocaust, including Rwanda. And I'm finding behind it was again, Darwinism. And that's very clearly there in the literature. And I'm 
found it, and I'm just doing the article now, showing indeed that that was central in the Holocaust that occurred in Rwanda, killing about what, a million, over a million people. And a million point seven, wow. I think they estimate. And so, uh, and Darwin's right at the center of it. And it's very clear from the literature and there is Darwin. Now, there are other things involved as well, of course. There always are. But on the other hand, I find Darwinism brought over by the Germans and the Belgians. And they introduce this idea to the Rwandan people. And they end up with uh, the idea that there's inferior and superior people. And therefore, one group thought the other was inferior and killed the Tutsis, killed about a million point seven, I think, of them. No one knows the number, but it's huge. And so here we go again. The harm that Darwinism has done in society. And all those people had to die for no reason. In this poor African, beautiful African country, I should mention. Because the Belgians, basically, they said one group there were more evolved than the other group. And they were the ones that instilled in the people that idea. And so, therefore, they took that idea in the Holocaust in that country. And it killed those that they thought were or less evolved, basically. So it's more complex than that, but that's it boils down to that. So I that's a work article I'm working on now. Well, that's great. I appreciate again, Jerry, all the work you're doing. It really is sad, the ripple effect that an evolutionary mindset and worldview can can lead to. And uh, you said it perfectly. You know, you go into into this work, into this study, uh, looking for gems, looking for treasure. And that's exactly what you find, brother. So again, thank you so much. Hopefully we can have you on again uh, for another uh, one of these many uh, fantastic presentations and topics that you've been talking about uh, now as well. So again, Dr. Bergman, thank you so much to the audience. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for all the awesome questions. And uh, please share this content around. The truth is, is so important. Uh, standing for Truth is out.